Hello, folks. Hi there. How's it going? My name is Nikki, he, him pronouns. And I'm Michelle, she, her pronouns from DSA LA. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening as we break down the Democratic Convention with our DSA Bernie delegates, as well as some special guests, including Marquita Bradshaw, Tennessee US Senate candidate, and our first presenter, who is Ian Gunther. He's gonna be telling us a little bit about uh, Milwaukee's history. But before we kick off the program, we wanted to share um, another project that's kind of like the culmination of getting all the DSA Bernie delegates together. It's just a little video and we'll play it for you now. We are Bernie Sanders delegates to the Democratic National Convention and proud members of the Democratic Socialists of America, representing the millions of people who voted for Bernie Sanders in the 2020 primary. That's millions of people who want a Green New Deal, Medicare for all, housing as a human right, free college for all, ending private prisons, a federal job guarantee, and getting big money out of politics. We've been told by the party that democratic unity is the way to make progress in 2020. So why weren't these demands included in the Democratic Party platform? As DSA members, we demand more. We stand in solidarity with those fighting for democratic socialism. And taxing the rich for a better world. Trump, Trump is, is a symptom. symptom. Capitalism is the disease. Removing one person from office will not be enough to address the serious problems facing us. COVID-19 has already killed hundreds of thousands of people here in the United States, and the numbers keep going higher. Over 40 million jobs have been lost. And countless people are on the verge of eviction. But the government has given everyday people crumbs. While overseeing a historic transfer of wealth to the ultra-rich. Workers' rights are being decimated, and union membership is at a record low. Millions have lost their health care and are paying skyrocketing premiums. Police continue their assault on Black lives and our civil rights. On top of all this, 2020 was the hottest year in recorded history. And scientists say we have 10 years to take action on the climate crisis or risk the end of human civilization. This violence and deprivation is a wake-up call. We can no longer deny that our system is broken. I joined DSA because systemic change happens when people rise up together in solidarity. Democratic Socialists are organizing the progressive left. DSA members are supporting progressive candidates, winning electoral races in our communities and across the country, passing legislation, supporting, supporting labor, labor strikes. strikes, protesting and taking direct action, and, and building, building a mass, mass movement, movement of, of the working, working class. class. DSA's work inside and outside the electoral system is its strength. We are organizing the working class to join together to fight against billionaires and corporations. They've got money, but we've got, got the people. And we demand an end to the cruel, inefficient, and life-threatening system we call capitalism. We need socialism in our lifetime. And, and we, we need, need your, your help. help. Not me. Us. Not me. Us. Not Me Us was a call for solidarity and continued struggle for a better world. Answer the call and join DSA. DSA. I Yay. love that so much. Anyway, so that we put that all together as kind of like an ad hoc group. Um, it started, this whole project started way back in May when I was running as a Bernie delegate with our other comrade, Jason Boxer, who is now, who would be on this stream, but he's busy running his school board race in Manhattan Beach, California. So he's running for office now too. Nikki is our electoral politics committee um, coordinator in LA. So the three of us got together and we're like, hey, there's this opportunity to get DSA members elected into this you know, a position here as a Bernie delegate. So we organized the GOTV campaign and called out to all our members here in LA and wound up getting 28 members elected across LA County into those seats, those Bernie um, district level delegate seats. And then afterwards, of course, we thought, oh, this was fun, this was cool. Let's try to connect with delegates from across the country. And so that's what wound up happening. And we've connected with over 180 DSA members who also served as Bernie Sanders delegates to the Democratic National Convention. Yeah. Ooh, so this stream, um, we're gonna hear from some of them and Nikki's gonna share the lineup mm -hmm. for tonight. Yeah, thanks Michelle. Um, we are, we got a whole program ahead of us. I'm really excited. Thank you everyone who's here. We got over 50 people here already. Share the link, let's get some more folks. 
Uh, but first up, we're going to hear all about the Milwaukee sewer socialists and hear what happens when socialists are controlling a municipal government. From there, we're going to talk to some delegates who were at both conventions, the 2016 convention, the 2020 convention. What was it like being a Bernie delegate both times and how does it contrast to one another? Then we're going to talk to some organizers who are organizing on the ground to abolish ICE. Really exciting conversation. Then we're going to talk to Marquita Bradshaw, who is running for Senate, the real Senate, the one Bernie's in, out in Tennessee. And after that, we're going to close the program. We're going to talk to some young delegates and hear about the future of socialism. So it's a really exciting presentation you got in front of you. I can't wait. I'm super excited. Um, Michelle, how about we introduce our first speaker? Exactly. We're running on time. That's great. Ian Gunther is the director at large of MKE DSA from Milwaukee. Hey, Ian, how are you? Thank you so much for coming. Hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, super psyched about this. Uh, wow, that was an amazing video. Uh, we've got a world to win, so no pressure, right? Thank you so much for being a part of this. All right, so we'll get started. Awesome. Um, so yeah, uh, I made this uh, presentation uh, along with uh, my partner, Jess, uh, to uh, talk about the sewer socialists. Um, so let's, uh, let's kick this thing off. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of an overview of what we're going to talk about. Uh, we've got our introduction, uh, how and why uh, this kind of came to be. Um, we're going to talk about how the sewer socialists mobilized. Uh, the socialists themselves, we'll talk about the in individual people that were elected to government, uh, their successes and their failures, uh, their le legacy, and we'll have a ni nice little conclusion for you guys. Um, so yeah, let's get this thing going. Um, so my name is Ian, uh, Ian Gunther. I'm one of the at-large directors on the steering committee from Walker DSA. Uh, I was elected treasurer twice by a chapter and was a delegate to the DSA's national convention in 2017. Uh, I'm currently attending Milwaukee School of uh, Engineering for a bachelor's in electrical engineering, and I've earned two associate's degrees in the Milwaukee Area Technical College. Um, I was also a nominee to become a Bernie delegate for the 2020 DNC. Uh, didn't quite make it, uh, but the people who got in are super awesome, so I'm really happy they got it in too. Um, what are my credentials? Uh, I'm a hobbyist Milwaukee historian. Um, I'm not really an academic on that on that front. Uh, I realized I was a socialist when I would uh, I started learning about Milwaukee socialist history a little less than a year before Bernie announced in 2016 his presidential bid. Uh, I'm a tour guide at uh, Lakefront Brewery now, uh, and we consider ourselves the ambassadors of Milwaukee. Uh, most folks send their friends and family members to us uh, when they come visit. Uh, I now incorporate bits of Milwaukee history into my brewery tours. And if you come see my technical tour, I talk a lot about how the Milwaukee socialists uh, and the labor movement in Milwaukee had a huge impact on beer production in our city. Uh, my sources are the Making of Milwaukee book and TV series by Milwaukee historian John Gerda uh, and the Sewer Socialist Volume 1 and 2 by Elmer A. Beck. Uh, Beck has thoroughly documented uh, the Milwaukee Socialist and Labor mo Movement a few years before the offices of the Socialist Party mysteriously burned down in 1975, destroying most of the original documents. Uh, without his research, uh, we would have lost a lot of the detail on how this movement came to be. Um, so yeah, what is the Democratic Socialist of America? We should probably cover that. Uh, the, the DSA, uh, or the Democratic Socialist of America, is the largest socialist organization in the United States. I believe we're over 70,000 uh, paying, dues-paying members strong. Uh, we believe that working people should run both the economy and the society democratically to meet human needs, uh, not make profits for a few. Uh, we are a political activist organization, not a party. Um, through campus and community-based chapters, DSA members use a variety of tactics from legislative to direct action to fight for reforms that empower working people. Uh, so check us out, check out Milwaukee DSA on our Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash DSAMKE uh, and see what we're doing to try and bring back uh, those policies and uh, those people that made Milwaukee uh, a, a really beautiful place to live. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, let's talk about how and why this happened. Um, so Milwaukee kind of was a, was a kind of crappy place to live uh, in the early 1900s and um, late 1800s. Uh, there was rife corruption that ran deep in Milwaukee politics. Uh, industrialists were purchasing votes uh, and allegiance from Milwaukee politicians for decades. Uh, this eventually culminated in Mayor David Rose, uh, known to the press as All the Time Rosie. Uh, Milwaukee was open for business, so to speak, uh, where gambling dens, all-night saloons, and brothels operated in broad daylight. 
graft was a big deal back then, and politicians took cuts uh, of money uh, flowing from the trolley and street lighting systems. Uh, there was rampant disease, uh, cholera, polio, and intestinal flu, uh, known today as cryptosporidium, and other diseases were rampant in Milwaukee. Uh, this led to the average life expectancy in Milwaukee around 1900 to be 27 years old. Uh, with children under five accounting for a very large portion of that average. Um, so vast majority of, uh, of funerals that you'd see in, in Milwaukee at that time uh, were of children. Um, pretty unfortunate stuff. Uh, pollution. Uh, I think this quote by a visitor to Milwaukee in 1881 about the Milwaukee River kind of says all, all that needs to be said about it. Um, it is a narrow and torturous stream, hemmed in by the unsightly rear ends of street buildings and all sorts of waste places. It is a currentless and yellowish murky stream with a water like oil and an odor combined of the effluvia of a hundred sewers. Nothing could better illustrate the contaminations of city life than this vile and noxious compound here among the wharves. Um, so we can take a look at that picture. Uh, it kind of demonstrates how bad air quality was uh, in Milwaukee at that point in time. You can even see some of the litter uh, in the Milwaukee River as well in that picture. Um, so uh, let's talk about who lived here. Uh, Milwaukee was a melting part, a pot of uh, European immigrants, uh, most notably the German immigrants. Uh, the defeat in 1848 of the revolution in Germany resulted in the exile of over 600,000 Germans. Uh, this paired with the publishing of the Communist Manifesto and a wave of German migration to Milwaukee that led Milwaukee to become known as the German Athens of America. Uh, many sought a new land to build a visionary utopia uh, in this municipality. Um, there were uh, The labor movement in Milwaukee grew stronger every year until nearly every machine shop and production facility flew union banners. They began fighting uh, for safer working conditions, better pay, and very importantly to us, the eight-hour workday that we kind of take for granted these days. This all culminated, uh, these labor disputes all culminated in what is known as the Bayview Massacre in Milwaukee. On May 4th of 1886, uh, unions called a general strike in Milwaukee uh, for their demand for an eight-hour workday. All major factories in Milwaukee shut down except for the Milwaukee Iron Company rolling mill in Bayview, uh, what is now a suburb south of the city of Milwaukee. Over 14,000 mostly Polish workers marched on the rolling mill with the express purpose of getting the workers there to join the strike. Uh, a day later, the strikers returned to march on the, on the mill. They were met with uh, 250 National Guardsmen under the orders uh, from Republican Governor Jeremiah Rusk to fire on them. An officer commanding the Guardsmen gave the more direct order, pick out your man and kill him. The riflemen uh, lined up and fired a volley into the crowd. As a result, several were injured and seven men were killed, including a 12-year-old boy. The shock and awe of this moment led to an increased militancy in the labor movement and a reconsideration of tactics. Uh, every year on the anniversary of the, Mo the Bayview Massacre, um, union and community leaders gather at, a, at the historical marker in Milwaukee in memoriam of this atrocity and the uh, names of the fallen are read. Um, so it was kind of a big deal. So let's talk about mobilization. Um, so after all that stuff happened, things, you know, kind of the gears started turning, I suppose. <laughs> uh, the labor movement realized that they could no longer simply organize unions and strikes to demand positive changes for their workplaces. Uh, now the government had in intervened on behalf of the factory owners to put down the strength of the union. The workers decided they needed to claim political power to ensure that the violence of the state would not be used against the labor movement again. So the Milwaukee idea was born. The labor arm uh, would work in tandem with a new socialist political arm of the workers to achieve the goals of the working class. Um, and so that is the Milwaukee idea, the concept of bringing the labor movement and the socialist movement together uh, as one. Uh, then the, uh, many of the socialist thinkers of the time uh, wrote in newspapers and worked in printing shops. They took an account of every household in Milwaukee and documented the language spoken by that household. Because there were so many immigrants from across Europe, uh, there were many, many different languages spoken. There were over seven newspapers in Milwaukee alone that were German-speaking newspapers and were written in German at this point in time. So you can imagine that you know Polish, uh, Italian, all, all across the board in Milwaukee. Um, then union volunteers across Milwaukee would mobilize within 48 hours to drop off literature written in the language that the household spoke. 
Um, this was known as the Bundled Brigade, which is a tactic led to a, a complete social sweep of Milwaukee municipal government, including the full common council in 1911. To put this in perspective with kind of what we're doing right now, you know, Bernie ran in 2016 uh, and we're in 2020 now, that's four years later, right? Um, so to put that in perspective, the Bayview massacre, um, you know, it took 25 years from the Bayview massacre until a full sweep of socialist governance in Milwaukee uh, for that to happen. Um, so I think that that's something that you should kind of think about when you're talking about political movements. These things take time, right? Um, so we'll also talk about the newspapers. Vorwärts was a popular German language newspaper in which many leftist views were discussed. Uh, some of the members of the labor movement and socialist movement were also editors and printers at many of the new uh, of the other newspaper companies in Milwaukee. Um, lively discussion and debate clubs were a popular facet and uh, and for the up and coming socialist party, uh, if the socialists were to win the hearts and minds and oration and political debate, they needed to sharpen their skills. So there was a lot of that going on. So let's talk about the socialists. Who are these guys that we elected uh, to power? Um, first, very notably here is Victor Berger. Uh, he was the first socialist the people of Milwaukee elected. Uh, he was known as the intellectual powerhouse of the socialist movement and was one of the founders of the Socialist Party of America. Um, for which DSA is actually a direct descendant of, uh, organizationally. Um, he was a journalist uh, when he emigrated to the United States and got his start writing in the Socialist Democratic Herald uh, and the Milwaukee Leader newspapers. Later, uh, he would found Vorwärts, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, and in 1910, he was elected to the United States House of Representatives. Notably, he introduced a resolution to abolish the Senate, uh, which he saw as an anti-democratic and corrupt institution. Uh, his resolution also included wording to make senators elected by popular vote rather than being assigned uh, to the position by state legislatures. Only that part of his resolution survived to become the 17th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Um, so kind of a big deal, this guy. Uh, <laughs> during World War I, Berger was convicted and sentenced to 20 years in federal prison for sedition, uh, citing his open anti-war stance. Uh, Wisconsin voters reelected him while he was under indictment in 1918 because uh, we liked him. Uh, no laws uh, at the time barred a convicted felon from the office, uh, but the House kicked him out anyway. Uh, Wisconsin held a special election a month later, and Berger was reelected again while in prison. Uh, he was finally defeated in 1921, but a year later he was re-elected again uh, and he served until 1928 after his conviction was overturned by the United States Supreme Court in 1921. Um, so this guy's a fighter and he kept on fighting for a long time. Um, let's talk about Eugene Debs. Uh, I'm only going to briefly cover Eugene Debs here as many of you should know him already uh, since his portrait hangs in Bernie Sanders' office. Uh, what is important to cover here is that Victor Berger was the one who radicalized Eugene Debs. Uh, Debs served six months in prison uh, for the 1894 Pullman strike in Chicago where 30 men were killed by the army deployed by the president uh, Grover Cleveland at that point in time to break the strike. Uh, while in prison, Victor Berger started writing letters to Debs and personally gifted him a copy of Capital uh, by Karl Marx. Reading this helped radicalize Debs into the social luminary he became. He founded the International Workers of the World. Uh, he was a powerful orator, and many of his speeches are a leading light to the American socialist movement today. Eventually, he ran for president on the Socialist Party ballot line uh, with Emil Seidel as his running mate. They earned over a million votes, which at the time was 6% of the electorate. Um, so that was kind of a big deal for that time, too. But speaking of Emil Seidel, uh, he was Milwaukee's first socialist mayor. Here we are in Milwaukee, a, a true working man and unionist. Uh, he dropped out of school at the age of 13 to become a woodcarver uh, and organized a woodcarver's union at the age of 19. Makes me think about what I'm doing with my life. I'm, I haven't done any of that. <laughs> he won an election for alderman in 1904 uh, and in Milwaukee and was elected mayor of Milwaukee in 1910. Uh, there he established mainstays of Milwaukee municipal government in the Department of Public Works, uh, the Police and Fire Commission, uh, and the Milwaukee County Park System, uh, among many others. Uh, he re he reigned in corruption and cleaned up uh, illegal bars and brothels and gambling parlors. Uh, and he did all this uh, in two years before Republican and Democratic parties teamed up to put him out of office. They actually teamed up to form one ticket uh, against him. 
Let's talk about the second socialist mayor of Milwaukee, Dan Hone. He's my boy. Uh, he was elected city attorney alongside Emil Seidel in the sweep of socialist politicians into Milwaukee government in 1910. Uh, Hone became the iron fist Emil Seidel needed to clear out graft in the deeply corrupted uh, government in Milwaukee. He was born and raised in Waukesha and was elected in 1916, four years after the end of Emil Seidel's term. Uh, Dan Hone's uh, administration as mayor lasted 24 years until 1940, which is the longest socialist administration in the United States history. Uh, part of so Hone's success was that he broke with the Socialist Party line and he endorsed the United States entry into World War I. Um, he organized the Milwaukee County uh, Council of Defense to assist the war effort. Uh, he served specifically on the food board of that council, and in 1917, price, price gouging on food costs skyrocketed. To alleviate the war profiteering that was going on, Hone and the food board intervened, selling food at low prices so that poor uh, Milwaukeeans uh, wouldn't go starving. Uh, Hone also finished the construction of the new infrastructure in the Garden Homes Public Housing Project, the first ever housing project, project of its kind in the United States. Uh, his administration created the sewer and sewage processing system still used in Milwaukee today, uh, which may be the single greatest relief of disease and death in Milwaukee ever. Uh, under his administration uh, and Frank Zeidler's, the Milwaukee County Park System grew to become the world-renowned emerald it is today. Dan Hone is also known to have chased out the KKK when it attempted to take root in Milwaukee. He stood against racism and blocked the Klan from holding events and rallies in the city. Like that guy a lot. Uh, so we'll talk about the third uh, socialist mayor in Milwaukee. Uh, Frank Zeidler is one of the most beloved figures in Milwaukee politics. If ever there was a paragon of what it meant to be a Milwaukeean, uh, Zeidler was it. He was elected mayor in 1948 and served until 1960. Uh, when in office, he began the annexation of land around the city of Milwaukee to broaden the tax base of the city and ensure suburbanites who greatly benefited from the city also paid for its services. Uh, he was considered a great arbitrator of labor, uh, was devoted to, to public transit. Apparently, he never drove a car, uh, always hitching rides with neighbors or taking the city bus. Uh, and he ran city government debt-free in the tradition built by the Milwaukee Socialist Movement. All right, let's talk about success. Um, so the landscape of Milwaukee changed massively under socialist administrations. The park system expanded to surround Milwaukee. Uh, Charles B. Whitnall was the park system's socialist visionary leader, and under his influence, he built the emerald necklace of park systems that surround Milwaukee today and drew up dozens of plans for the park system that are still being executed today. Um, then for innovative policy decisions, much of the details of the innovations of municipal governments uh, are discussed in Dan Hone's book titled City Government, The Record of Milwaukee, the Milwaukee Experiment. Um, it's a bit of a dry read, but uh, the highlights include uh, the hiring of public workers instead of the usage of private contracts to complete municipal projects, uh, the conversion of Milwaukee's sewage uh, sewage into plants fertilizer instead of just dumping it uh, and funding research and development of city planning solutions in-house rather than outsourcing. Uh, we had a very infrastructure driven focus, the construction of the Garden Homes Project, the sewage processing plant, the annexation of the private street lamp system, uh, the building of roads and bridges, the expansive park and recreation system, public hospitals and more uh, dotted the landscape in their time. Um, they were pretty revolutionary for women's inclusion. Despite not having the right to vote yet in the United States, uh, women were welcomed as fully fledged uh, voting members of the Socialist Party, which was unheard of at that point in American politics. Debtless budget. Uh, the Socialists ran a pay-as-you-go system to finance uh, the city government. Um, this combined with a rabid aversion to debt made the Socialists, uh, made the socialists create a government that weathered the Great De Depression. Because of this, Milwaukee was one of the few U.S. cities that did not go bankrupt during this time. Uh, public health and hospitals. Public health was a big priority for the socialists. Uh, Milwaukee launched a prevention and vaccination program that helped double the average life, uh, citizen's life expectancy between 1900 and 1930. So from 27 years old being the life expectancy in 1900 to 60 years old in 1930, just 30 years later, kind of a crazy deal. Um, it was so successful 
that Milwaukee had to be disqualified from municipal public public health awards because they won first place over a dozen times. I guess you got to make room for someone else to win it. <laughs> uh, also, during the Spanish flu pandemic, Milwaukee had the lowest infection rates of any major metropolitan city in America, thanks to the rapid and decisive action by Dan Hone and the Milwaukee Common Council. Wouldn't that be nice right about now, right? Um, all right. Well, let's talk about their failures. I'm not just going to boast about them. Uh, there were some some pretty bad stuff too. Let's talk about racism. <laughs> uh, Victor Berger was a fervent right racist against uh, all quote uh, yellow men immigrating to the U.S. Uh, kind of a bad dude sometimes. Um, and then anti-immigrant uh, to him, socialism was a distinctly European phenomenon. Um, there was some internal fracturing. Uh, disagreements mounted on topics of immigration, race, war, and peace that ended up fragmenting the Socialist Party. Uh, Victor Berger was total a dick. I, kind, of, kind of a total dick. I, I pretty much covered that. But um, Berger's ideological sparring partner, Morris Hillquist, uh, is quoted as saying, he was sublimely egotistical, but somehow his egotism did not smack of conceit and was not offensive. It was an expression of deep and naive faith in himself, and his unshakable faith uh, was one of the mainsprings of his power over men. Um, so honestly, not the kind of guy I'd want to invite to a party. <laughs> women's exclusion from leadership. Uh, although women were full voting members of the early Socialist Party, uh, they were systemically blocked from positions of leadership within the party. Um, so that's something we hope to, to work on these days. Uh, Republican and Democrats uh, parties united to defeat them. It should be no one's surprise uh, that the forces of capital, the Republican and the Democratic parties would unite to defeat the socialists where they stand. And so they combined forces on tickets, uh, voting, voting tickets under the concept of unity to bring down the likes of Emil Seidel and Daniel Hone. So let's talk about their legacy. Um, so ultimately, the anti-German sentiment of World War I and World War II, combined with the first and second Red Scares, crushed the socialist movement in Milwaukee. It was considered a shame or even traitorous to speak German in, publicly in Milwaukee. Uh, and the labor movement was systemically dismantled over time. So uh, since you guys couldn't make it to Milwaukee and Stephen Colbert took a big dump on our city, uh, I wanted to give you guys a little tour of our city of my own uh, to talk about some of the highlights of Milwaukee uh, rather than some of the lowlights. We got this wonderful map that I, I put together here uh, from Google Earth. Um, and this is uh, kind of a bunch of land, landmarks that dot the landscape um, of kind of socialist achievements in Milwaukee. Um, you'll notice that there's a big concentration of things in the center of uh, the city proper. And then we have this um, kind of ring of parkland that surrounds Milwaukee County, uh, known as the Emerald Necklace of Milwaukee that the socialists built. So let's talk about Lake Park. Uh, one of Charles Whitnall's first works, uh, Lake Park is, uh, was, is probably the most recognizable landmark in Milwaukee. Um, and at the time, it was an industrial wasteland and trade, train yard that was annexed by the city of Milwaukee and turned into the East Side Jewel, one of the most beautiful stretches of parkland in the United States. Uh, the sewer socialists had a goal of re rescuing all coast and river property from private ownership so that they could be used for the enjoyment of all Milwaukeeans. Here's Washington Park, uh, called the West Side Jewel of Milwaukee. Um, also a very big expanse of parkland uh, with a wonderful theater area for folks to put on performances. Here's Mitchell Park, uh, containing the Mitchell Park domes and botanical gardens. I highly recommend you visit this place when you come to town eventually. Uh, in the dead of winter, this place is a tropical paradise with exotic plant species sourced from across the world. Unfortunately, it has been in decline for a long time under the neoliberal governance in Milwaukee. Whitnell Park, named after Charles Whitnell himself, uh, the guy who designed our park system um, uh, after he left government. Uh, he is quoted as saying, every home should feel the environmental influence of natural shores with essential forest support, which is something uh, I can definitely believe in. Uh, MATC, although not technically established by the socialists, uh, under the socialists, uh, it, was, it became the first college to offer night classes for laborers by law. Uh, and so at that point in time, when you wanted to go to school, you'd have to go sc to school during the day uh, if you wanted to become uh, work in the technical trades. Uh, and so what MATC offered uh, was an opportunity for day laborers to go to school and increase their lot in life, uh, which is kind of a big deal. 
the Zeidler Center for Public Discussion is one of the few active institutions from the socialist era. Um, it seeks to facilitate intercommunity discussion and bridge divides uh, where there's conflict in the community. Uh, this is an old shot of the Garden Homes project, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Gar Garden Homes neighborhood was eventually sold off to private owners, but the community remains as a testament to the strength of socialist urban planning and engineering today. Uh, Greendale, <laughs> a lot of people don't know this, especially people who live in Greendale. In 1936, the U.S. Department of Agriculture began construction of three new communities known as the Greenbelt Towns as part of President Roosevelt's uh, New Deal. Uh, one of them was built in Milwaukee. Uh, it was a full village planned and built to enhance the bonds of community. Uh, these homes were eventually sold off to private owners as well after the federal government di decided to divest from public housing in 1949. Uh, so we actually have pretty much a whole city in Milwaukee uh, that was built uh, with, with socialist ideals in mind. This is Turner Hall. The Turners were some of the 600,000 exiled Germans that came to America to start a new society. Uh, the Turner motto is sound mind in a sound body, uh, endorsing a healthy lifestyle with a thriving political discourse. Uh, over a hundred years, uh, they were advocates for increasing democracy in America, including being early supporters of the women's suffrage movement. Uh, Frank Zeidler uh, was a big proponent of Milwaukee Public Broadcasting, which has some of the highest viewership of any PBS membership station network in the United States. Then we have uh, Sandberg Hall. Uh, Carl Sandberg was an Illinois poet laureate and a friend of Emil Seidel. Uh, he became secretary to Emil Seidel's cabinet, and his name remains today on the main dormitories of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Jones Island, the term sewer socialist was initially served as an insult to the type of practical and responsible governments uh, the Milwaukee socialists envisioned. Uh, in 1925, under the oversight of Dan Hone, the Jones Island active sludge processing plant completed and was the largest such processing plant in the world at the time of its opening. Along with the uh, strong public health policy that the socialists enacted, uh, this plant was a major factor in increasing the life expectancy of folks who lived in Milwaukee. Hone Bridge. Uh, thousands of Milwaukeeans cross Hone Bridge every day without realizing that it is a symbolic infrastructural tribute to Daniel Hone's legacy. Crossing over the Jones Island sewage plant uh, his administration constructed, as well as Milorganite, which I don't know if you guys are uh, know about that, but uh, Milorganite is a kind of a grass fertilizer you can probably find at a Home Depot or Lowe's or something like that. Uh, and Milorganite is literally made from Milwaukee and poop. <laughs> so instead of dumping that stuff uh, at a trash heap or out in the, uh, in the lake, uh, we convert that stuff into uh, stuff that can be used for fertilizer uh, and sell it. And that actually helps fund uh, the sewage system in Milwaukee. Uh, so that's one of those innovative uh, kind of solutions that we came up with in Milwaukee. So that was a wild ride. Um, so I'm just going to read a, uh, a quick uh, quote. Um, this is one of the most beautiful quotes that I've ever uh, read. And it, it's one of the, the reasons why I am a socialist today. It honestly brings me to tears every time that I think about it. Um, we wanted our workers to have pure air. We wanted them to have sh sunshine. We wanted planned homes. We wanted them to have living wages. We wanted recreation for young and old. We wanted vocational education. We wanted a chance for every human being to be strong and live a life of happiness. And we wanted everything that was necessary to give them that. Playgrounds, parks, lakes, beaches, clean creeks and rivers, swimming and wading pools, social centers, reading rooms, clean fun, music, dance, song, and joy for all. And that was a quote by our first Milwaukee uh, mayor, uh, socialist mayor, Emil Seidel. Thank you guys for listening to my presentation. Uh, you can probably tell uh, this is a little bit rushed. Uh, there is a heck of a lot more information I can give you. And if you would like to ask me some questions about this or the broader context that led to this moment in our city's history, uh, please feel free to private message me, um, at me on Twitter, at Hone is my hero. Um, shout out to my partner, Jess, who is our chapter's lead graphic designer. Uh, she put this slideshow together and created our chapter's logo, which is shaped like a manhole cover in reference to the sewer socialists. Uh, and you can check out her work uh, on our Instagram page at, at J underscore Rose underscore Poizel. Uh, so go check that out. She's doing some really cool stuff out there. Um, yeah, thank you guys for listening to my presentation. Appreciate it. Oh, you might be needed.
<laughs> Looks like you're still muted there, Michelle. Oh, there we go. How's that? Um, I was just going to say thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation, and I learned so much. And uh, dare I say, even maybe a little more than what I might have learned this week <laughs> at the actual convention. But we did learn a lot um, at the convention. Ian, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to sign off again. If um, anyone wants to get in touch with Ian, we'll post his information, um, his handles, et cetera, on the chat. Um, next up is we're going to kind of recap both 2016 and 2020. Um, with two delegates who served in both uh, conventions. So I'd like to welcome Zenaida Huerta and Gina Harris. Hey, Zenaida. Hi. Hey, Gina. Hey. Welcome. It's good to see you again. I just wanted to um, set the scene for everybody. Now, in 2016, I was a volunteer and I got one of the positions to be a Bernie delegate, but in the end, because of how the votes turned out, um, I didn't go officially, but I did get on the floor one night um, and then I protested a lot outside. You two, on the other hand, were in the thick of it. Um, I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about it. Zenaida in 2016 was the youngest delegate. She was only 17 years old and she's back again this time around. Gina Harris, too, was the one um, elected delegate for Bernie in CD37. But this year, I, along with Greg, Greg Gavrelas, because of how st uh, strong showing Bernie made in California, the three of us got the three seats. We're all the SA members. We got the three seats for our district. So our movement has been growing, but there are a lot of things that we still need to work out. So um, I'm just thinking this conversation, you know, subtitled You, Me, and the DNC. We'll just talk about our experiences and where we see um, us going as socialists working with the Democratic Party. So um, Zenaida, you want to say hello? Zenaida is also one of our co-chairs for the comms committee here for this DSA delegates group, along with Sebastian um, Casares, who you'll hear from in a little bit. How are you doing, Zenaida, after this week? I'm doing OK. I think, I mean, I guess I don't know quite exactly what I expected. I knew it would be so much different than what I experienced in 2016 and 2016. We, even though we were the minority on the floor, we had each other and we were next to each other and we were able to see each other's faces. And that camaraderie is so important in um, building connections for organizing in the future, right? Like I met Gina in 2016 and we've kept in touch since. And those connections made at these conventions matter for that reason. And in 2020, you have absolutely none of that, right? Like we're all on a virtual basis. And not only that, but even in the video conferencing rooms that we're in, we don't, we're not even allowed to see each other. So like, I don't even know how half of the delegates in California look. So that's like a totally different experience, I guess, just to summarize like a general uh, comparison of the experiences. But other than that, it's just been like a really, I don't, I guess a demoralizing experience because I was hoping to come out of this feeling at least some kind of enthusiasm with organizing with amongst my fellow delegates in California. And it's hard, but I'm glad that I'm part of DSA because that's the type of, that's the type of space that provides that type of enthusiasm. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was an absolute pleasure. We kind of just got all together after um, the election and we just kind of searched for one another on the various platforms like Slack, Facebook, et cetera. And then now um, we were able to come together for this event. Gina, how about you? You know, aside from the obvious, what was it being virtual this year and then in person in Philly, um, what, what are the contrasts, some of the major contrasts for you? Um, I think the major contrast was that um, the DNC hasn't learned much. Uh, well, that's not, I guess that's not a contrast. Uh, but, um, you know, hey, well, being featured on one of their commercials was shocking. So that was a contrast. Um, but also, I think that this time around, the tone is a little different, um, only because we do know, like, you know, Trump was in office. In 2016, it was like, you know, to me, we had like, a, we didn't have this negative, like balance, like we knew we had hope for the future, like we knew what would happen. There was just so much kind of like surrounding this convention. And um, a lot to me of fake symbolic solidarity, like, you know, you want um, to appear like you're a rah rah, like, yay, unity. But we know that in the party, unity is supposed to be uniformity. 
and compliance. And, um, and so what I just realized was that now I, I feel like I'm that my cage is even smaller now because I have to definitely do something. I actually have to do something about Trump in office, but I don't like being, you know, waterboarded the unity uniformity thing again. So that was what was different for me because to me, it's a little bit heavier feeling because it's like, okay, for my community, for my family, for my future, for everyone's future, I got to get this man out of office because he's a flipping fascist, but I don't want to agree with you. (laughs) That's kind of how I felt. But, you know, we do agree with them. We agree that Trump needs to get out of office. How to go about doing that might be something where we have a difference, right? We're more policy based. We want to pull everything to the left. Obviously, all three of us voted no on the platform this time around because of Medicare for all language, right? And um, we just- And no Black Lives Matter uh, language. Um, They, yeah, that was another thing for me too. Yeah, so there are a lot of um, kind of holes missing from um, the platform, obviously. But then again, the platform is just a piece of paper, right? It is a statement of values. It's kind of a mission statement. It has its values because it states the mission. But the fact that the party can't even state Medicare for all, medi- um, you know, healthcare as a human right, that's what we here at DSA, obviously, we have so many committees that are working on that too. And uh, Gina, you're a nurse. You've been organizing mm-hmm. with Healthy California. And Zenaida, I know you've been so involved also with the young um, Democrats here, right, and the young delegates. So um, if you want to just start talking a little bit about what um, you guys did this convention in terms of your organizing within the convention and with your fellow delegates. I know Gina, too, she had a nightly live stream called um, Dem Missed Fit Black Girls, where she and a number of other delegates got together. So um, Zanaida, why don't we start with you and just tell us a little bit about the work you did this time. Yeah, I think I I started off organizing with a group called the Young Delegates Coalition. And I, I admit that in the beginning, I was skeptical of getting involved with the group because the concept is that it's all Warren, Biden, and Sanders, and Buttigieg, young delegates working together. And so obviously, I wouldn't think that having conversations about Medicare for All would be conducive in a group like that. But I learned very quickly that a lot of times the young people can have these conversations about uh, Medicare for all and justice a lot easier than maybe a lot of our older activists. And quick, quickly, I learned that there are a number of Biden delegates in that group who were organizing their delegations to vote down the platform because it didn't include Medicare for all and who were raising the issue nonstop about the presence of corporate lobbyists. And even one of the Biden delegates in the group went on uh, the Daily Show with Trevor Noah and called out the presence of corporate lobbyists and the lack of Medicare for all on the party platform. And that's something that I think uh, we maybe miss out on sometimes that I th- the key part of organizing is communications. It all comes down to like how we talk to each other and how we uh, really share our, our backgrounds about why we care for Medicare for all and why we think it's important. And here, here are the numbers and why it's like the obviously the best solution. So that's just one, uh, I guess, one overview of getting involved with the Young Delegates Coalition. But secondly, the main uh, organizing project that I was involved with was organizing to try to get AOC more speaking time at the convention. So at first we learned that she was going to get 60 seconds. And obviously she got 37 seconds more than that, but it's it's not enough, especially compared to how with open arms, the party welcomed its arms to Republicans and especially in California, we're familiar with the anti-immigrant platform that Meg Whitman ran on for California governor. We're familiar with the anti-choice and, LG- and anti-LGBTQ plus background that Governor John Kasich ran on. And yet these people are being invited and being told that they're core parts of the party and that they're needed to help defeat Trump in November. And sure, they might uh, vote uh, they might vote for Biden, but what about the House? What about, uh, what about the Senate? What about when it comes to candidates like Marquita Bradshaw? Do you think that Governor John Kasich is going to be throwing his weight behind everyone, behind our candidates? So it's like, it's the Democratic Party through the speakership, even though the speakers aren't like the core part of the party, but they're saying that they're throwing more solidarity behind these Republicans than they are people within people like us. So that's just one project that I got involved with. We ended up getting about 530 
delegate signatures and over 6,500 uh, signatures from Democrats across the country demanding AOC get more speaking time, and yet she was only rendered to have a minute and 37 seconds. But yet in that short period of time, she did more to open the eyes of people than people like John Kerry did in their full length speeches. Absolutely, yeah, everyone worked so, so hard this time on organizing out, practicing organizing outside of the main event, it felt like. I felt that was really fruitful. So Gina, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience too, doing um, your organizing, independent organizing. Um, yeah, so, you know, a lot of my independently organizing was kind of jumping around. Um, you know, I mean, of course I signed on, like if Zenaida reached out with a petition, I signed it right away um, and tried to do as much as I could. But, you know, I was really, got, I'm getting good at practice, this practice of threading the needle. Um, one thing I will say, just um, what I forgot to mention earlier, is that one thing I was looking forward to with the in-person convention was coalition building. Like All right, Gina. Oh, Gina, back. I think we switched the transition. Okay, we'll wait for Gina um, to get back on. Um, in the meantime, the call. Oh, all good. Okay, well, we're Gina, we're we're having a little trouble breaking up a little bit. Hey, Gina. All right, Zenaida, we'll we'll hold it down here while we get Gina back connected. Hey, I think she's girl, back on. Back. I'm good. sorry. Um, uh, you know, this is why I'm not going to talk about the Communications Act of 1996, but, you know, <laughs> throttling your broadband speeds. I know Spectrum knows I'm using a hell of a lot of broadband, but I don't care. You know, um, anyway, what I was saying was I was looking at coalition building um, from 2016 to now. You know, I have reached over and I have talked to the moderates and I have talked to the Fifty Shades of Blue. And I was looking forward to that in 2016. So um, what I've been doing. Nope. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. So <laughs> it, she has been doing a lot of coalition building. And so uh, we'll wait for Gina to come back um, to this. Oh. All right. Maybe Gina, Gina will reconnect. I you know, did work with her. You're good okay. now. We hear you. <laughs> All right, um, I'm terribly sorry about that. So I, uh, yeah, so I was looking forward to just, um, you know, coalition building. I uh, did work to put together a DNC coverage show called The Misfit Black Girls. And it was really because we wanted to create a unique space for a uh, black progressive. For black progressive, she was on every uh, left. night. Um, some of the some, um, but... Oh, okay. We're good? Yeah. Yes. No? Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm actually connected to an ethernet. Uh, but yeah, so we, uh, we, we did our own DNC coverage. We were Black Bernie delegates and actually another um, Marlena Lawrence, who's a, a LA commissioner, um, she joined us too. She does what she calls polytainment report where it connects entertainment and politics together. It's a really interesting concept and a good show. And she joined us. And so uh, we did DNC coverage every night, but we really emphasized on, you know, black community, black business, trying to create a space that even the DNC doesn't create. Um, as you see, they Black Lives Matter is only a, you know, only a topic for votes to them. Um, but uh, nonetheless, that's mainly what I was working on. But like I said, I was jumping around, uh, kind of doing some coalition building. Um, and, you know, like just trying to take as much a, a advantage as you can in this virtual space. Um, it's really, a, really hard to, you know, really push for issues. Um, my idea of hijacking the hashtag wasn't that great because I don't think the DNC did a really good job. Um, but I don't know if that's a topic to discuss a little bit later, but uh, yeah, it was. Yeah, nothing really got trending, right? I know Zenaida oh <laughs> and Sebastian, we're every day, we're like, what, what should we try to hijack? And everyone's like, nothing. <laughs> the DNC hashtag, hashtag DIN convention, which was the official DNC hashtag, wasn't even trending even the night before the DNC. I looked at it Sunday night, it wasn't trending, but what was trending was vote red 2020. And that's a little, that's a little disturbing that the Republicans are trending and a week before their own convention, but we're not trending the night. 
Zanaida, do you want to speak to that a little bit? So, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Z Gina, you back? Zanaida can go. I'm, I'm going to, I can fix this. Okay, so let's let's talk about this. Um, we want to talk about the VP pick a little bit too, because I know both of you are connected. You know, have different connections to that effort. Um, before uh, uh, Kamala Harris was picked, there was an effort from our delegation to uh, petition for three um, three Black African American women to um, to possibly take that position. Um, can you talk a little bit about the work that you did specifically with that, Zenaida, and the young delegates, ultimately, um, what happened with that project? Yeah, so I got involved with a group of young delegates in California, young Bernie delegates in California, and we wanted to organize some kind of effort around Barbara Lee, and at least encouraging Joe Biden to put Barbara Lee on his shortlist, because at that time, I think the, his shortlist had about 12 different names. And we were just hoping that Barb really would be added to that. And we understood that given that we're in a virtual convention effort, obviously organizing is a lot different. And it, and we thought that we could create a, very, a short video with each of our faces saying that we support Barb Lee for why, for all of her progressive records and always standing with us. And we set that out through the California Young Democrats. And obviously was not necessary, which is not, ultimately successful, but I think that we did shift the conversation and we were one of the first groups actually making some kind of VP effort. And the fact that it was led by young Bernie delegates, I think is telling because we're, when we talk about who's in the White House, it's often a lot about affecting our futures for decades to come. And that even though uh, the White House term is only for four years, obviously we know the effects of one presidency spans lifetimes. So. That's one effort that I was proud to be a part of. Great. And then Gina, um, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about your experience as a very uh, more leftist um, black woman who is obviously supporting the ticket, um, but you know that doesn't mean that what you were talking about unity and uh, some of the issues about being kind of bullied into a stance. Um, you know, that need of the hole of the needle keeps getting smaller and smaller, um, you know, being black and on the left, uh, it was difficult, you know, because and, and it's because, you know, people atta attack Kamala for things that weren't necessary, like her race. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, I, and Trevor Noah spoke to this yesterday. He said, would Kamala still have been able to sit at that lunch lunch counter and a Jim Crow South? The answer is no. Kamala would have been had, well, she would have been treated just like an, any other black person um, during the civil rights movement. So when people attacked her about her race, she's not black enough. She was this, it was like that conversation. I had to come to her defense, you know, like that's not the conversation we want to have. When people want to talk about her criminal record as an attorney general, Okay, yeah, Kamala, you you can talk. You know that's okay. People want to talk about her uh, alleged uh, relationship with the at the time Mayor Willie Brown. That's not okay to have. You we are not slut shaming here. You know uh, we do not do that around here. So I had to come to her defense there. But you want to talk about her uh, marijuana prosecutions? Okay, we can talk about that. So you see what I'm saying? Like I'm literally doing this um with that ticket and it was like i have to defend her here but then like you know i am critical so i came to the conclusion that you know just because i may say yeah i'm going to support this ticket to get the fascist out of the white house once again that does not mean that i will not be in washington dc and on inauguration day holding a black lives matter sign for biden you know what I mean? Like that doesn't mean that I'm giving up on any of my issues. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to continue to fight for Medicare for all. That just means that I know that I have a better chance of pushing these issues on that side than I do with Trump in the White House. So it's like I am the needles getting threaded and I feel like sometimes I'm getting attacked on both ends. Right. The moderates are saying, you know, you might be responsible for four more years of Trump and then the progressives and on the left are saying, well, you're you're becoming a moderate, you know? So right now I just feel really squeezed in the middle. Um, and it's it's getting a little difficult, but I know I'm doing the right thing because, you know, now as an LACDP member, 
um, I have 300 and something thousand people in my district. And even though I'm tiny, tiny elected, this is a teeny tiny elected position, I still feel like I need to represent them. And I think that if more elected officials actually thought about their constituents when they made decisions, we might not be as bad off as we are right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much for both of your work. Um, just to wrap up, you, Zenaida, I know you just joined once the convention started. You joined DSA when the convention started. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So so I'm a new member. You're a new member. So what made you take the leap before we log off? We want to hear everyone's little DSA story. I mean, I'm a democratic socialist because I believe that everybody deserves basic needs in short. And I guess I don't need to like list out what that entails, whether it's people deserve a right to housing, people deserve a right to health care, and people deserve clean air and clean water. And I, even though my placement as being a democratic activist, it's like a lot of, I, I guess like it seems like where like Gina was speaking of being like a lot of tugging in between where it's like, I want to use the democratic party as a vessel for a lot of these issues. But at the same time, I don't think it's perfect. I think there are a lot of fundamental flaws with the influence of corporate lobbyists. And a lot of like, we saw it at this convention where like rules that were supposedly these uh, tri uh, long established part of the Democratic National Convention just went like that, right? Like you have this, the DNC platform committee and they're there for a reason. They're duly selected members and they write this platform and it says, and fossil fuel subsidies. And all of a sudden it just disappears, right? So it's rules matter only at the Democratic Party's convenience. And I learned that to be the case at this uh, 2020 convention. And I know that was definitely going a little bit rambly off your point from what you asked about why I'm a DSA member and proud democratic socialist, but I'm just saying it's like this weird tug and pull of being like, here's my values and I'm trying to enforce it, my values of being a DSA member through the party. But at the same time, I'm not gonna be naive and say that like everything's going to happen until like, but it only happens when we build DSA membership and continue uh, running for like different positions like LACDP and especially local positions. Yeah, we have to get our hands dirty. It's not an easy task at all. Um, so thank you so much, Zenaida. I'm just gonna ask Gina real quick, to take us out, wrap us up. Tell us about your DSA story. Uh, so I became a DSA member after Bernie 2016, I think maybe 2017 or somewhere in there, I think I got my first DSA membership. Um, and it was through Katrina, I don't, you guys know Katrina. Um, and so I got my, I, she kind of pulled me more into DSA. She's like, this is going to be where it's at. Let's do this. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, but then I also started continuing into the party. So I haven't been able to put a whole lot of attention on DSA. But, you know, when it came to the conversation of socialist, um, I was like, you know, if making sure people's grandparents have the medication they need by, you know, and not having to worry about paying for it makes me a socialist, fine. If maybe making sure um, babies have food in their tummy, fine, then just call me a socialist then, because those are the things that I want, you know, I, I, and I think those are human rights. And I don't think that, you know, I don't think that the, you should, this word socialism should be bad. Um, I'm just fighting for people to live a good life and, you know, and not be so oppressed. Oh, and not be oppressed. Yes. Building a better life. building system. I can know, yes. yes. Thank you guys so much. Thank you Thank both. You. We will see each other soon, I'm sure, as our projects continue. Solidarity. All right, moving on. That was so good to catch up with these two ladies. Um, Sebastian Casares is going to be moderating our next panel on ICE, abolish ICE. It turns out that the Democratic Convention gave very little time to this very serious issue. So we're so lucky to have Sebastian moderating with his two panelists. Janet Hurtado and Raquel Rojo. He's gonna do a little intro and then they'll set right into the convo. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Good to see you. He's also, he's also one of our young co-chairs here on the comms committee here at the DSA DNC delegates group. That is me, thank you. Um, okay, everybody. So our presentation today is going to be centered um, on ICE, abolish ICE, um, coming from the Latinx community that will be talking about it, who are also Bernie Dells. And we're gonna be talking to some very awesome delegates um, and happy to have them on. And we're gonna do some quick intros and then we're gonna intersect it into how this connects to DSA, how does it connect to the DNC, electoral politics, organizing, so on. 
and our personal thoughts about the issues and our you know immigrant connections ourselves. So um, hopefully we can have the other delegates hop on if we can get this thing going. What's up? And by the way, I'm, I am he, him, DSALA. So that's me. I'm, I'm in the Santa Clarita area for North LA County for DSALA. And then we got Jana Hurtado. What's up? Hey, you guys. I'm Janet um, from DSA, DSALA also. Awesome. And then Hello. Raquel Rojo, uh, DSA El Chuco, she, her, her, ella. <laughs> nice. Okay, awesome, awesome. So first off, what we want to start off with is we're just going to talk about, we wanted to connect it to, you know, our own kind of stories and our own connections, you know, why we're here talking about ICE and things like that. Like, um, for me personally, I definitely have privilege in this area. Like my family came through the Bracero program um, and that that was a program that recruited, you know, migrant labor and immigrant labor. And it was much more easier to get your citizenship or stay in the country. You didn't have this level of of um, a deportation state, you know, uh, and you didn't have, you know, Department of Homeland Security, this whole DHS kind of system turn into the the the, the thing it is now. So I, I have privilege in that area, but I've always been passionate about immigrant rights and I still come from a family that has, you know, immigrant history and and Chicano kind of like uh, history and stuff like that. So that's some of my story. And so Ra Raquel, if you want to talk about what you've, you know, experienced. Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. I just like you, you know, my family um, came. So I'm first generation born. My grandmother um, migrated here, um, like between the fifties and sixties. Um, and it was a couple of times that she did, she did in fact get deported, but it was much easier back then. You know, you get deported and you come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, she started off in Brownsville, Texas, a little bit further down. Um, eventually, another relative told her, hey, you should try Juarez, Mexico, which borders El Paso, where I am now. Um, so when she came here, she and she used to work, you know, cleaning houses, you know, taking care of kids, you know, just uh, anything really that she could do. Um, eventually the employer, she had an employer that was, um, very sensitive, I guess, to her situation and even sponsored her. Um, so my grandmother didn't really used to talk too much about it in the beginning and she would get choked up, you know, telling her story. But I do know that once she met this woman and helped her, you know, get her, um, her green card to be able to work here. And then eventually, you know, she became a citizen much later. But um, after after that lady sponsored her, that she was able to bring my my um, mom, my uncle, and so that's how eventually I was born here. Awesome. And it's interesting when you describe that. A lot of that's very similar to my family experience too, and how my my, my abuelitos got their citizenship and things like that, or their cars and stuff. So, um, Janet, I'm, I'm you know we'd love to hear you know your experience and and your personal story when it comes to when we're talking about immigration and ICE and things like that? Well, my um, my experience is more recent with um, a family member that is, um, is undocumented. He he's It's not as easy as before to get their citizenship. It's like much harder if it's, you don't have the money, you don't, you can't do nothing. So um, it's been a lot. It's been hard, you know. It's been hard, and um, it's a it's an everyday struggle with work, with care that the the Megan is gonna come and you know take him or the kids. It's it's scary. It's a it's a scary situation to live, especially right now with everything that's going on with our president and all that stuff. So it's it's hard. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt, I'm sure. And so, um, and I think that's kind of interesting to see that because we talk about, in a way, I mean, what many people view is like state-sanctioned violence, you know? When you when you talk about that kind of stuff, a lot of that has evolved and you can see me in, um, in the Raquel story, how much it's kind of happened over the years and you can just like, just trace, not just our personal story, but trace that to the history of this country and and the militarization of the border and of ICE and of, of 
even police and like you can just see even the, the department of homeland security like you can just see it like slowly progress in this kind of different section it hasn't been to before um that's the, part, so, that's the part that gets me too is like you always hear people say well why don't they just do it legally well that looks very different from when our families mm -hmm. came here you know like yours sebastian and mine um even even latinos you know they they make that argument well our family did it the right way yes mm -hmm. 20 30 40 years ago you know where there was programs in place where it was cheaper where it was more attainable where there wasn't all these um loops to to jump over you know it was it was just a different time and like I just you said, you know, the militarization and everything else that has made it even more traumatic. And then the the kid, you know, the kids being scared of the police, thinking that que son la migra, and you know what I mean. They grow up mm -hmm. um, scared, just thinking of that the police is, and they're gonna come and they're gonna take their parents away. You know, like so that and if if it affects anybody, it affects the kids a lot. You know, it's mm -hmm. not that easy. It's not that easy. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, that that was not my experience at all. So I I can't even imagine, you know, fearing that my mom or my grandma or you know any loved one is going to be deported at any given moment. Yeah. And now they send you. You know how they send you if you want to emigrar, te mandan. They send you out of um to Juarez, and with all that violence and all that stuff. And right now, I think um everything's on hold, anyways, right? Um, oh my God, I, I think just, I. I don't know. I heard there was a backlog, like all the way to like 1999, early 2000s, or something like that. It's it's sad. Mm -hmm. And so, one thing that so we want to talk about too is like, um, how how did this how does this struggle intersect to you know other things of of detention and ICE raids and other things like that? How does this intersect to issues like? electoral politics you know how does that kind of connect to these things we're talking about and to you know these campaigns here like um senator sanders and i think a lot of people there was always that kind of conception right that it was like white bernie bros or something like that but you look at california and it was like 71 percent um of young latinos young latina latinx you know went for sanders it was like an unprecedented turnout you know, it was like there hasn't been a candidate that inspired that much of the Latino vote, you know, in droves like that on the Democratic Party in years. And so, we, you know, now we want to try to connect. Like, how does this connect to DSA? How does this connect to electoral politics? Like, why why do y'all think that, you know, our communities ended up going to Sanders? Like, if, you, if any of you have thoughts on that. To me, um, Bernie was like the only hope. Mm -hmm. Like, he was, he's my inspiration. Now I'm gonna call you guys more. Um, I don't know, maybe um, he gave me faith. Mm -hmm. No, I get you. It's okay to cry. I, <laughs> I cried on the DNC. I, I think we're all with you, especially this week, man. <laughs> <laughs> like someone for like someone died this week. <laughs> right? Let us mourn. I, um, I thought I was done mourning though. I thought I was done mourning. I joined DSA the day after Bernie Sanders suspended his campaign. And I thought I was done. Obviously, I was wrong. You know, like it's sad. Well, I mean, I think it for me it was like a, another blow or another slap in the face when you know we each part we all participated in our state delegations and there's some pretty progressive platforms i mean even even for texas texas has a more progressive platform now than the dnc platform you know and so for them to write out and rewrite the language on so many of the things that we all believe in it is a slap in the face you know that's why we participated that's why we were bernie delegates to make sure that the things that we all fought for will continue to you know have a, a space and that's not happening so i i feel you janet mm -hmm. i think um the way that it that it all connects you know and i think that the reason that a lot of us connected also with bernie's message is that he sees the humanity 
in migrants, in immigrants. He's an immigrant himself and he recognizes that. He identifies with that. Um, when you read the stance of the Democratic Party on immigration, everything comes back to the economy. Everything is about money. These are people, we're all people, we're all human, you know, like where is the, where is the empathy for that, for the people who are, you know, leaving their countries? I mean, you know, our families came from Mexico, but there's other families that come from really war torn, you know, very violent, even more violent than Mexico has been recently, even more violent, you know, and they're crossing through different countries to make their way. I can't even imagine that. So for me, I think that's the biggest difference is that he, him, his platform, um, democratic socialists, we see the humanity in immigration and it's not just about money. 100%, 100%. And it's interesting to see how that kind of resonated throughout so much of our community. And of course this, you know, immigration is intersectional, you know, immigration can impact you know, Black and African American communities. It's it's immigration and deportation is big with Southeast Asian communities. You know, but but it is to Absolutely. be said that you know the the Latino, the Latinx, Latina, the our community came out and helped deliver. You know, and we're a big reason why California had so many delegates, right? And 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 we tried our best to be in the DNC process, but you know, I try to submit language on CPB and ICE. That was more radical, but you know the DNC didn't adopt it. Is what it is, right? Um, but I think that's interesting. The fact that you know we all kind of, you know, I'm from a little different part of LA. Janet's from a different part, and then Raquel, like you're from you're all the, you're all the way in Texas, but like you, you see eye to eye to us on so many stuff. And so, um, I was wondering, like, what do you kind of think? Because like we're DSALA, but like, what do you think from like, how did these issues kind of connect to maybe Texas and like border towns and things like that, like in your area or, or if there's any kind of connections there? Well, I mean, if you, if you look at the, at the results, all of the border cities also turned out for Bernie. So, you know, that kind of just speaks again to what we were talking about. Um, as far as like, how does that connect to capitalism, which is what you were asking earlier? Um, when did we start seeing like such a mass deportation? You know, ICE hasn't always been around. You know, these uh, private detention centers haven't always been around. So it's almost like chicken or the egg, which came first? You know, did they build them and now they have to fill them and there's quotas and now there's a higher criminalization of the very migrants that sustain this country? It's, mm -hmm. it's just insane. <laughs> Most definitely. And like, I'm glad you kind of um, mentioned that too, because like when you, you mentioned capitalism and, and I think that that's a good kind of transition period is like, there's a reason too, like all of us are, you know, DSA members too, right? Like we're not just um, Bernie Sanders voters, right? Like we, we um, at least found some kind of space or calling um, or passion to, say you know to to identify with this kind of dsa organizing and i think it brings us something interesting because because at the end of the day you can see how this broad system of capitalism is like intersectional with all these kinds of stuff even whether it's mass incarceration and the po and and police and 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 the the profit motives of that and what's going on with that you know and and those conversations being brought up by the defund movement and stuff like that but then also just kind of like how you know profit and things like that drive these kind of human rights abuses in many ways. And on top of that, it's like, there's a reason, right? It's like, it all connects to like labor too, you know, migrant labor, immigrant labor. Like you, like you don't see, you know, some bougie people being deported and grabbed by ice, you know, it's almost always labor, the poor working class. And it's like, it totally connects to that want for labor. Not, not to mention that, like look at neoliberal economics and what, what that's done to Latin America too. Right. And, Exactly. See, it's a whole other conversation. Yeah. It's all connected. I mean, that that's where it starts, right? The destabilization de of these countries, and now they come here for hope, and they're not wanted here either. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Um, so on on top of that, like, um, 
I, I think bef before I'm, we moved on to another topic, like in regards to capitalism and stuff like that, like I, I kind of wanted to talk about like, um, kind of like how these struggles of like capitalism interlinking with ICE and, you know, calls for, you know, abolition and dismantling and things like that. Like how, like if there's ways that you've kind of seen it in your local community, how maybe money or capitalism or things like that might connect um, with with ICE and things like that. If y'all had any opinions on that, like um, Janet, if you had anything to say, if not Raquel, like regarding um, the connections to like profit or poverty and, and being working class and things like that. Like how does this connect to this broad issue, you know? If any of y'all have thoughts, because <laughs> I could go on and on, but I don't want to like take over. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, talking too much. I know. I was waiting for Janet. I felt like I'm hogging space too. <laughs> um, I think that it's time. It, it all goes hand in hand. It all goes hand in hand. The politicians with the money, they make the money, and of course, with the with the but people like us, like people, those pobres, those brown people, just it's it's it, it all goes hand in hand. Like um, low. I don't know how we're gonna change that. I just know that I'm gonna I'm not gonna stop. You know I'm gonna keep trying. I'm gonna organize. I'm gonna um, ching come on chinga la migra because it's time <laughs> for them to, you know, go away. Chinga la migra. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we need shirts with that. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I agree with Janet. I mean, when you have, like I said, a platform that pretty much says that immigration reform is tied to the economy, like you're just you're just setting up for the continuation of exploitation of, of mm -hmm. people that are trying to come to this country, you know? So at least for me, that's why I think that, and that's why I wanted to also get involved. One of the aspects why I wanted to get more involved and I'll be honest, I haven't always been because it is close to home and it's hard to see. It's rough. You know, I can't, like I said, I can't even imagine what Janet's experience is because just being one generation detached, it, it hurts deeply you know to see and and to have it so close to home but i think that's why i want to get involved even you know with local uh politicians we for our city we have a mayor that has not necessarily been sensitive to the needs of of migrants you know so that that influences what happens you know, when these people come here, when they need help, when they're, uh, when they need legal representation, all of that, you know, so for me, that's why I want to continue. Um, and, you know, one of the things from this campaign also is starting from the bottom up, right? That's how change mm -hmm. happens. And we could do everything that we want and we can, uh, demonstrate and we can you know hold marches and we can do everything as organizers and as activists but when you have the powers that be that don't believe in the struggle and they don't see again the humanity and all they see is dollar bills or the strain on the economy you know i read that it's more expensive to de to detain than to actually track these people or to keep tabs on them you know, while they're going through the process. I mean, what does that tell you? Yeah. If it's more expensive to detain them than to let them live their lives and just, you know, kind of like on a probationary period, where's this money going? Mm -hmm. Who's getting it? You know, how, how is that allowed? Yeah. And that's that like same story of detention too. Like even, if you can see how just this detention carceral state kind of connects, like I'm pretty sure it's more expensive to like lock people up than to like put programs to, you know, rehabilitate and, and, you know, have restorative measures for like 
other stuff in regards to just general criminal justice, you know, the, the, the profit motives and things like that are kind of um, insane, but in regards just to that- process. You know, Oh, sorry. Just no, the process can, of when, yeah. when they're in like in the detention center just makes me think like once they're in there, it's so hard for them to even find a way to like, like um, fix their problem or like to talk to a lawyer or to even find those people in the detention mm -hmm. center because they get lost. Even the kids getting lost you know, because they separate them from their, they literally kidnap the parents and they take them then, you know, like the kids are, they end up in foster care and that's another, you know, system, another, it's it's just a big circle and it's, oops, sorry you guys, it's messed <laughs> up that yeah. they do it that way, you know, like, and then yeah. they, you know, they pretend they, they that they're police officers, they lie, it's just, it's just a whole bunch of, Mm -hmm. So on on top of that, then so like to wrap some of our thoughts up, you know, why again, like so we've been talking about it. This connects to capital. This connects to profit and greed and stuff like that. And you can see violations of human rights, immigrant rights, you know, all kind of connected. So it's like, what can you do, you know, like, and I feel like we've talked about why we we vibe with you know democratic socialism and stuff like that because it's about humanity over capital. It's about recognizing human beings over just you know profit margins and you know putting people like a a game or something like that so it's like what can you do like like and like we as we ran for bernie delegate right like we all tried our best to influence the dnc but the process didn't really seem to you know i mean we did what we, what we could and there was good things there but there was also still stuff like you know there was more republicans than like latinx voices you know it's like they had obama narrating an immigration video, like tone deaf y'all, like, and our community still remembers the Obama Biden administration. So it's like, why DSA, you know, like why organize like, and how is, has DSA helped you or have you seen direct programs for immigrants like Janet? Like, I think that you can maybe speak upon that, like with um, the, the help that was provided. I currently um, participate, I'm involved with the um, Immigration Justice Committee with DSA LA and, um, they're awesome. We are doing some awesome work. We're helping people that didn't qualify, undocumented people that didn't qualify for the stimulus check. And um, they don't ask them questions. They don't make them feel uncomfortable, which is the, like, I like the most because people don't want, they don't feel confianza to like talk and That's say their good. things because they don't know who's talking to them. So the, the fact that they don't ask them questions to make them feel comfortable, I think is great. Um, with the, you know, they're, um, they're, they're fundraising, they help. Um, that's what we're doing now. We, we're doing um, actions. It's just, it's a wonderful, it's wonderful. You should see like the people are so grateful because they don't know where else to turn for help. And then DSA comes along and then they've been helping. So I think we're doing a good job. I think DSA is awesome. My experience has been awesome, okay? <laughs> Yeah, I'm cool. I'm I'm fairly new. I actually just signed out um, after Bernie um, suspended his campaign. On a personal level, I've uh, connected with Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy, um, who help with the pro bono legal representation for a lot of the migrants. Um, and we just also, um, as a chapter, endorsed Vettel who is the person that is running for mayor. Uh, if she wins, she'll be the first Latina mayor for El Paso. Um, she was a Bernie delegate for, uh, for Texas. And she's all about pretty much all the things that DSA represents. So um, that's where I personally will be shifting my focus now and helping that campaign. Cause again, from the bottom up is where we can make some changes. Awesome. And y'all summed that up, ended it perfectly because Janet talked about the organizing aspects, the stimulus, like, and, and Raquel, you're talking about, you know, how, you, you know, DSA can influence electoral politics and get people, you know, elected in office and things like that. And get, even if, you know, we can't take on the whole federal system or take on the entire Dem party or whatever it may be, it's like, <laughs> We can do local stuff, right? And that's what attracted me to DSA because I like to do, I like politics, but I also like to do activism in the streets. And I've been involved in, them, in some movements a lot this summer. And it's like DSA was like the only thing that combined the two. 
And so both y'all just answered that perfectly. And speaking of electoral politics, the next segment is going to be uh, kind of transitioning to some things that we can see electoral politics too. So muchísimas gracias. Thank you all so much. Raquel, Thank Janet, you. y'all are amazing. Thank you for coming <laughs> on sharing your stories. Solidarity. Solidarity. Keep up the fight. Um, any any quick last comments about DSA or anything? Being a Bernie Dale, just like a goodbye or anything? Uh, so to all my Bernie bros over there, like, I'm just kidding. Um, no, join DSA. If you're not a member, join DSA and um, come and help us do the work. Yeah. <laughs> help us fight the good fight. <laughs> That's right. Okay, thanks, y'all. Take care. Thank you so much, everyone, for all your hard work. Awesome job, Sebastian. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you, Janet. Thank you so my um, my Bernie sister, we both were on the campaign staff this time in LA. And also I see Reggie in the chat, another delegate who also is DSA member and a former Bernie staffer here too. So this is a really nice reunion. I am really excited though for our next panel too. We have... Um, Jan Lentz and also Michael Antonio Jones, the co-chairs of Memphis Mid-South DSA. They are gonna be um, having a conversation with Marquita Bradshaw, the Tennessee Democratic candidate for US Senate. And she has an amazing story. You guys, hi. Hey, hey from y'all. Memphis. Yeah, hey, from Memphis. Um, I'm just gonna let you take it away and kind of set the scene and just about how amazing Marquita's story is. And then just what, you know, in the little interaction that we've I've had with her planning the show, she just seems like such a lovely person. Like, I can't wait to hear more from you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so actually I first met Marquita in this room where we're sitting right now uh, in a chair across the room uh, about a year ago. She was uh, the treasurer for Frank Johnson's campaign for city council, who our local chapter, uh, DSA chapter endorsed as well. And she was sitting there and I, you know, I said, well, tell me about yourself. And she said, well, I'm running for US Senate. And, you know, never in a million years that I think a year later we would be back in this room talking to her virtually uh, with all of you all across the country. And it's very exciting to be here. Um, but I didn't grow up in Memphis, Michael Antonio did. So I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about that. Um- Marquita is from Memphis. Uh, she's from South Memphis. Uh, she's been a lifelong environmental activist. Um, part of that stems from a Superfund site in her neighborhood. And that's kind of been the basis and motivation for her to go across and advocate for uh, meeting people's material needs. Um, and so we are just so incredibly excited to speak to Marquita and discuss her huge upset win. Um, so Marquita, hello, how are you this evening? Good. What is it? Night? Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> How are you? I like your t-shirts. I'm yeah. well. Thank you so much for bringing them to us. Uh, it was really nice holding holding a sign at the polls for you on election day. So um, very happy to do that. Um, well, we want to kick right off and, you know, being from Memphis, uh, this is a very Memphis question to ask to start off. Uh, but what high school did you go to and what neighborhood are you from? <laughs> I actually am from like the Mallory Heights neighborhood. And um, I went to Central High School, but uh, Hamilton High School was like really, really close. That's where my sisters and brothers went, but I went to Central, the high school. <laughs> <laughs> um so we, we want to kind of talk about how uh, your neighborhood affected um, and shaped your politics um, and how it kind of inspired you to go into environmental activism. Well, like when when I was younger, my neighborhood was young and thriving. It was full. It had a it had a strong, thriving local economy. Right. It had florists, bakers, grocery stores and um, even a drive-in theater, uh, just to let you know, and with 17 schools. Uh, So it was a lot of children, it was a lot of businesses, and everybody knew each other because either we were family or we were friends. And so we were rich with love and and principles. Um, And so we we could walk to the produce store, we could walk um, just about, anywhere that we needed to go, um, but we did drive some, 
but I, we also walked to school, uh, my brothers and sisters and I. And across the street from our elementary school was a defense depot. Uh, just to, just, you know, you could, I drove by the neighborhood the other day just looking like how close it was to our elementary school. And this place is a super fun site. And it's one of the dirtiest ones in the nation because it's a national priority list super fun site. We didn't realize that growing up, in 1995, I gave birth to my son. I was 21 years old and my great grandmother was dying of cancer um, that year. And 24 hours after I had a cesarean section birth, I was put out the hospital. Basically my insurance company told my doctor that they would only pay for 24 hours after I gave birth and I went home. I was, um, sick with fever and my son was too. My grandmother with her third grade education, she was a doula. She saved my life and my son's life. Um, and she coached me through breastfeeding as she was dying of cancer. She was a healthy, health conscious person. She grew her vegetables in her garden, um, a lot of fresh foods. And not only did she grow a garden in her backyard, she grew one in our backyard, which was next door. And she, and she also provided an affordable housing unit for people who were struggling. She would let them not pay rent for two months um, to get on their feet. Um, and so that was on the other side of her. And um, so this lady just built community wherever she went. She was amazing. Uh, my great grandmother, we call her Madea, which is uh, how you say mother dear in the South. Uh, and so Madea was the type of person on Sunday, not only could she feed her family, which is which was like all of us and uh, all her grandchildren her and great grandchildren. She could also feed the whole church and the neighborhood. She would just cook that much food. Um, and so it was always community when it was like around her and she was giving and she was loving. And so to see her die of cancer was very traumatic to me. When my mom took action and went to the PTA meeting to inform other parents about what was going on at the Defense Depot, that was the catalyst of her and other parents and and community leaders and clergy and small business owners forming the Defense Depot Memphis, Tennessee Concerned Citizens Committee. Her name is Doris DeBerry Bradshaw. Mm -hmm. And she and my father worked together, um, set an example of community grassroots community organizing. And so one day we didn't want to go pass out flyers uh, I was working on my paper and my sisters, they were ducking out. It was hot as 80s outside because it was summertime in Memphis. And, you know, um, that was the day that we started talking about how reproductive cancers were running rampant in children from the ages of 13 to 18. Um, prostate, testicular, uterine, ovarian cancer. And me being a young mom, I was like, what are we going to do about it? And so that day, me and my sisters and their friends, we formed Youth Terminating Pollution. It was not a single thing. We learned the power of we. We learned how to work together to hold a federal agency and many other federal agencies accountable when it comes to, to environmental laws and seeking transparency when it comes to environmental laws. That was the catalyst that got me politically organizing more than just voting. Because a lot of people just come into the political process and vote. But when you start getting other people to participate in holding elected officials accountable, holding federal agencies accountable, and getting people to understand the political process, that's when you get beyond voting. And that's where you find your power of we like we did as a community. And so as knocking on doors in my community grew into a career, 
where I went through the AFL-CIO Organizing Institute and became a union organizer. My first, first uh, apprenticeship was with Unite Here. And we work, I work with many other labor and community organizations over the years. But what I did for 25 years was always volunteer for my community about, around the issues of environmental racism. The best way that I can illustrate environmental racism is that there are over 1,100 Superfund sites in the state of Tennessee, whether they're national priority lists, active or inactive. And they, and they call those archive. And just because it's archived doesn't mean that the health and safety standards is good for people or the physical environment. And so when you look at Tennessee, there are 95 counties, right? How does 220 of those Superfund sites end up in one city, Memphis, Tennessee? Well, that's what environmental racism looked like for brown people, for black people, indigenous people, and poor white people. And so you have to look at the rest of the 1100 com so those are 1100 communities and some of them are overlapping in memphis right and so there are people across tennessee who want to have healthy and safe communities and people want to have healthy and safe communities where they live learn work worship and recreate in our message of listening and listening by leading is what attracted people to the campaign and get activated as becoming um, not only a voter, but also learning their power we and taking ownership in, in this campaign. And so they became the organizers because now they had the tools to become relational organizer when it comes to, yes, voters, and then voters are within families, families are in communities, Communities make up cities and cities make up this state. And so that's how we were able to secure the primary. Those five things, those were our five stones against the Goliath that we faced, which was a lot of money. But we're not, you, you know, if you look at it, we've always fought big businesses, whether it's organizing and um and unions or even corporations and and even um holding the Department of Defense and other federal agencies with very big dollars. So we've always had to fight big budgets as a grassroots community. So money doesn't scare us because we have people. Can, can you talk a little bit about your platform? You've hit on some of the high points of, of your background and, and clearly that has informed the work that you do, but could you um, talk about how that's informed your platform and some of the specifics about your platform? And so the platform is based on environmental justice principles where people who are closer to the pain ha should have a voice in determining the solutions to Absolutely. issues that they're facing. And so that happens by listening. And so when you see um, the Healthy and Safe Communities platform, when you look at uh, immigration reform, when you look at uh, education, when you look at uh, environment, and when you look at um, the economy that works for hardworking families, that has come from listening to people who are telling their story. Just like I told my story, there was empirical data in every aspect of, of that story. Um, the loss of manufacturing jobs, other people are having that across their communities. And then the loss of small business the small business, the, the thriving local economy, it's not there anymore, right? Our communities have been seeing divestments over time. And it's not just Memphis, it's happening in rural Tennessee too. Absolutely. And so if you take the South Memphis out of it, people see themselves in some part of my story where they've had to watch a family member die because they live close to a polluted place or they're not, they, they wanna have clean water or have broadband aspect. Um, um, access in rural Tennessee, and that's part of the Green New Deal. And so just being able to take those stories and put it in a way where when you talk about health care, people want not only 
uh, access to Medicare for all, but they wanted to be patient centered where you don't have a sick care system and you have a system where it follows the health outcomes of the individual and their experiences, how they feel that they're being treated. And see, that's revolutionary within itself. Let the dollars follow the patient being well. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you've talked about um, meeting folks and talking, hearing their concerns. Um, and so I kind of want to transition to like your campaign across the state um, and how you've been meeting folks in the far flung areas. Um, and, and what has been your interaction uh, statewide and especially leading up to the primary um, when, you know, there is an establishment candidate who was funded with $2.1 million uh, against you? Look, it all starts about listening and going where people don't want to go or places they didn't think that were important. So, yes, I went to Paris, Tennessee, where there wasn't a lot of votes, but I knew that community needed to see a U.S. senator um, that was concerned about their voices and what was going on in their community, what they needed for their youth and just listening to those people celebrate their Juneteenth celebration for the first time, I had to be there. Um, and so just showing up in the way that I showed up and how I was listening and I was always communicating with people and listening to their narratives along the way, whether it be in Blount County, Lincoln County, Shelby County, they knew and they felt that they could trust me with their stories because I trusted them with my story. And that's how we reached places that we couldn't physically touch once COVID happened. Um, and we started doing town halls and and pretty much um, it wasn't my intention not to raise money. Uh, my list was big enough to raise uh, $10 million, supposedly. Right. But um, people didn't think Tennessee was a battleground state. But now they know. Absolutely. Um, can you talk, you mentioned COVID, can you, can you talk a little bit about how that has affected your campaign and the strategy and, and having to retool? Okay, so I'm a grassroots organizer and the biggest tool that I have is canvassing and door-to-door -door organizing, right? And so my heart was just shattered. <laughs> when that biggest tool we had went away. And so, but because we started early um, and we understand the principles of relational organizing and, and implementing those tools into digital organizing and having those conversations online and having those town halls online, involving people through the different types of social media platforms. Um, I didn't know what a Reddit was, but you know, I I participated in it uh, because somebody on the staff knew exactly what it was. And of course, um, you can measure, you can't really measure people's involvement in a campaign by how many Twitter followers they have, right? Because I think it was a whole story about how much social media interaction that each candidate had and how much one candidate was going to win because they had uh, 14,000 compared to uh, maybe 4,000 um, uh, Twitters followers or whatever. Well, Twitter followers don't equate to actual voters in the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And so we were having those conversations. And when it came time for election day, election days, because we have early voting, um, uh, just the involvement of having the DSA endorsement and the having people actually at the polls uh, was really instrumental in people understanding, you know, what Bradshaw 2020 was all about and uh, having those conversations at the at the poll and then actually being out there on the, and at the polls myself. Uh, and we, we flipped some Republicans. Um, explaining to some DSA members uh, what uh, what Medicare for all really is and then having that patient-centered um, aspect of it and uh, 
we're talking about education and environment. Um, yeah, we, we flipped a lot of Republicans because their candidates are not talking about those issues that are core American issues. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we know that we're going to win in November is because we stay to the issues. It's not about people. It's not about Marquita. It's not about a Haggerty. It's about what people are experiencing across Tennessee. And that is what got us here so far. And we're going to continue where we were with a lot more money and a lot more staff because <laughs> we have staffed all the way up. Um, we've onboarded a lot of people and we are pushing full speed ahead. We launched um, a test run of our, our touring to make sure that we can stay safe um, and that we can do social distancing events outside as um, long as the weather is good. It did rain in one place, but we still uh, did pretty good. Uh, you can go to Facebook and Twitter to see some of the great pictures of us walking around in um, Congressional District 4. And yes, we are hitting every congressional district and that's our organizing approach because we know it's going to be those relationships that gets us to where we need to be as Tennesseans. And that's turning away from systematic racism. That's turning away mm -hmm. from having poverty running raging through all of our communities. And that's turning away from having pollution in all our communities. And so we are so excited to be in this place. Please go to marquitabradshaw.com to learn more information and um, get involved because we have a volunteer coordinator that's ready for y'all. Uh, we've had over 500 people sign up to be volunteers since election day. Um, and we've raised with, you know, it has been some large donations, but mostly Working people have been giving their donations, even sending them by check. And so we've up, we're up to almost two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars since Election Day. Um, and that's hardworking people trusting me with their dollars that are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And that's how I knew I was going to win, because <laughs> when I started looking at the Act Blue come in and I saw that somebody was actually giving two dollars every other week with sometimes 75 cents i said this is about to happen i was like and it's going to happen with no money because i was looking at the job titles and it said unemployed retired and it was from all the small cities across tennessee and some of the big cities too and i was like yes we we got this and i said I said, Ma, I see a pathway to victory. She's like, she thought for sure I was crazy. And I was like, no, I see the pathway to victory. And it's through working people. And that's how we're going to win. And so she still say, she she thought I was losing my mind. And she's like, cousin, she's like, well, what are you doing? And I was like, I see the pathway to victory. And I still see that pathway to victory. And it's in each of you and each of us pulling together and being a unified front to make sure that hardworking people have a true representation in the United States Senate. I want to, I want to, quickly, um, that you mentioned uh, about how you were talking to folks at the polls um, and you flip Republicans and you, you know that Tennessee is a very red state. Um, and so people may not give this race as much thought as they should be and paying attention as much thought as they should. Um, what is your message to folks who are just, you know, not thinking about giving this race as much thought as, as they really should? They can keep sleeping on it, but we're not, you know, uh, it's, it's about putting a, putting your foot to the pedal and actually getting stuff done um, at this point. And that's what it's all about. And we've already, we, we've not only inspired Democrats. But when I was at a very conservative crowd with the Farm, Farm Bureau, um, we've even inspired Republicans who want to be able to be a part of their leadership who don't have a whole lot of money. So this is going to, it has set a blaze in our community of people wanting to be a part of the political process and knowing that they have a place, no matter who they are, 
and how much money that they make. And that even if you come from South Memphis or Paris, Tennessee, or any small town in Tennessee that has been underrepresented through this whole political process, that yes, you can become a U.S. Senator too. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. It's a, an absolute joy to, to get to talk to you and, and talk to the DSA burning delegates nationwide. Um, and we have a lot of people watching tonight, very excited about your campaign. Um, maybe just one final question, which is, um, could you tell us why the DSA endorsement matters to you in your campaign? Well, to tell you the truth, um, the Democratic Party, a lot of their members are really um, seasoned and um, and they may not be able to do lit drops or even actually man a poll um, or or even have the ability to canvas. Um, and some of them will, you know, but it's a younger crowd. And that's what made me know that the DSA endorsement is very important because if I can get like older black women that are conservative to vote for me and young people vote for me, we can feel that that voter gap that we have um, that we need to get to in November um, by all of us working together. And so I was like, okay, you can not go the traditional route and look for endorsements from candidates. You need to work um, in the community, get people who are normally not involved in the process and get younger people energized and on fire and actually show up to the polls. And y'all did that. And so thank you so much uh, for your endorsement, DSA. Thank you for the opportunity to, to help you win. We're, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it together, so. And that's what we are. That's, it is made people pay attention to Tennessee and not just the United States, but I've, I've gotten emails from other parts of the world, um, like Saudi Arabia, and said we are the last, the world's last hope in Tennessee right now today. Wow, that's that's incredible. Thank you so so much, Marquita, for your time and your the, your campaign is an inspirational. inspirational. Absolutely. Yeah. We will do everything we can to make sure that you win yep. um, because we, we need you desperately. And, and, uh, Thank you so much. And I could not have done as much without you. And I appreciate how much we're going to do together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marquita. Thank you Bye. so much, Marquita. Bye. Thank you so much to our Tennessee delegates as well, Jan and Michael Antonio. And then I also see a number of um, Memphis Mid-South chapter members in the chat too. Um, our next segment's gonna be for the young delegates. I also ask um, for us to stay in touch with Memphis Mid-South too, because I'm sure they'll have updates as to how we can all get involved, whether it's donating money, but especially our time for phone banking for Marquita so she can win on November 3rd. So. Young delegates, we have Nikki Martin. Nikki's gonna be um, moderating. He is not a delegate, but he is the coordinator and this, the stream guru for tonight. So we wanna give him a round of applause for that. He's done a great job keeping all of us in the right place. So with that, Nikki, take it away. Thank you. Oh, have I been on mute the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, folks, start over. My name's Nikki. I am not a delegate, but I am young. I am only 29. I think I'm the oldest person on our, our segment here. Uh, but what I said was I wanted to bring back Sebastian Zanita, which I already did. Thank you so much for being back on the screen. And thank you so much for all your help on this project. They were so helpful. Crucial getting this done. Um, and we also met some other delegates from across the country. First, 
another delegate from California, Orange County, California. In fact, welcome to the stream, Nina Baldwin, everybody. Hi, Nina. Hello. Hi. And then another another person out in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, everybody, welcome, Elo. How's it going, folks? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. All right. Um, so we wanted to talk about how the shifting ideas on socialism have changed a lot. We all call ourselves socialism. You know, 20 years ago, that wouldn't make any sense. So my first question for everybody uh, is, how did you come to find socialism? How did you start to call yourself a socialist? How did this feel like the right word to describe you? And let's just, we'll go through uh, each person. I'd love to hear what everybody has to say on this. Beatle, kick us off. How did you find socialism? Yeah, sure. So I came to North Carolina directly from Lima, Peru. So I grew up there for the first 10 years of my life. Um, super conservative, uh, as you can probably imagine. I was a Catholic school kid. Um, and I mean, Peruvian Catholic school is like another level of hardcore, like with the ruler and everything. It's, uh, it's pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a very, very, very conservative family. And I do think that uh, being somebody from the LGBTQ community, being somebody who's bisexual, I think it was, I think that kind of definitely made me a little bit different from the rest of my family. So I always had kind of a different feeling about everything, like a completely w different worldview. And growing up in North Carolina, I really didn't have uh, any other like friends or people in my group that were leftists at all, not, not even liberals, folks. Like, I mean, we have, it's, purely red Republican, uh, rural North Carolina. Um, but I always kind of had a, just a different worldview. I don't know how to explain it. I was just, uh, it, it was just different. I never subscribed to, you know, hating people for who they were and like fiscal conservatism, all that stuff. So I do remember um, when after college, uh, I moved to New York for a few years. And this was during the 2016 campaign. And that's when I saw this guy called Bernard Sanders. And I was like, oh my God, who is this guy? Um, the first time that I remember running into anything about Bernie Sanders was, I think I was on Facebook and I saw some article about him that was completely blown out of proportion that like he only wanted kids to like have two shoes or something. And so I was like, oh my God, nobody wants that. Like nobody wants a communist, right? Um, so um, I already had this misconception about him and then I saw his campaign launch speech and I was like, if that's socialism, then that's what I want. Like, I've never heard a politician talk like that before. I never knew we could ask for this stuff. I never knew this stuff was possible. Um, and from there, I was completely hooked. So I remember I was in um, his first Washington Square Park rally. I just went by. There were like 20,000 people that showed up. It was the first time I think that the media really noticed that there was a, a real movement going on. And I was right there. I remember watching Tina, Nina Turner speak and like being blown away. Um, and then I joined the campaign um, as just like a person that never really been involved in politics before. Um, that's when I learned, I, I met a lot of DSA friends. And then, you know, a few years later, I moved back to North Carolina and uh, that was it. I joined DSA and, and now I'm here. Love it. Awesome. Nina, what about you? How did you come to find socialism? Yeah, so I guess you can go back to like growing up. My dad was the type that would always have like political conversations at like the dinner table. And so he was always a very progressive person already. And so I already got like a lot of my values from him. And then from and then I got I guess like I further like agreed with that when my dad was laid off after working for 20 years because of outsourced jobs. And so I just also had that worldview of like, things aren't really fair. And, you know, the way that capitalism works, it doesn't really work the way that is, you know, works for people. And then when I went to college, I got a degree in economics, which was, you know, I, I guess you, you could say I wasn't really like socialist at that point, but it actually further like made me realize how broken like markets are the way that it works in capitalism. And so then at the end, uh, it was actually really Bernie Sanders in 2016 as well, where I realized that I totally agree with democratic socialism and I want to <laughs> join DSA. 
Excellent. Sebastian, how about you? Yeah, so it's kind of interesting because I think that there were definitely, um, you know, my I still grew up in a progressive liberalist family, but they actually kind of got more left as the time went on too. So like even they kind of, you know, like my folks even started getting a little more like woke to it. Like my dad voted for Reagan and now he watches Democracy Now. Like, so even, I think even the, even the world has like um, kind of shifted and 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 I think the Latino community and the uh, Latinx community has, has like kind of shifted a bit slowly too. But um, we kind of helped that process, you know, like me and my brother, I feel like helped got our folks and our other members in our family more left. And there was a kind of generational thing to it. I, you know, I, like I mentioned before, like I do have some kind of history when it comes to, you know, family members that, you know, did stuff like with Cesar Chavez and like, you know, labor and stuff like that. And, you know, I always had that labor perspective. And then on my mom's side, they're actually um, Puerto Ricans that immigrated to Hawaii in like 1901. They're this like group of, if you can look at on Wikipedia, like Puerto Rican immigration to Hawaii. And so because of that, you know, on one end, you know, if you know any history, U.S. history, and how the American government has treated Puerto Rico, it's just like, you know, that that alone would radicalize anybody if you like really read up on that. Um, but also, you know, that connected to like Wall Street and things like that. And on top of that, the kind of like Hawaii connection, like I was because of my closeness to the Hawaii culture, I was always very critical of colonizing culture and Western, you know, mainstream kind of stuff. And so. I actually, which is interesting because they mentioned a conservative family. I didn't have a conservative family, but I grew up as one of the only people who had that viewpoint that was like pro-labor, anti-colonizing crap. But I, I grew up in a conservative city here in Santa Clarita, which is like the, like one of the only red places in Orange, in not Orange County, in LA County, North LA County. And so I think because of that, that, that kind of pushed me and my brother to go more left, I think, because the fact that like we were against these values and we were seeing just like so much like luxury or like people with bigoted views. And I feel like it made us be critics of like our own local culture. And then we kind of started studying stuff. We just kind of realized like a lot of this is just like peak capitalism. Right. Um, so I think that kind of set me in that direction. And and my brother was like, you know, followed Sanders when he was uh, when he first announced in 2015. And so I kind of was a product of that environment as someone who was like super passionate about politics and activism and stuff like that. But, you know, I was like 15, 16 growing up under Bernie running and also, you know, Trump won when I was 16 years old. And so that's when I was 16 was when I first started identifying with Democrat socialism and socialism on the left. So in a way, it's like a product, not only of some cultural things, but also like there is most definitely a generational thing. And I'm seeing even people in this conservative community that are my friends who support the work I do that are getting more left too. And like that like Sanders or that like the idea of socialism, sometimes more than capitalism. And I think more people critique it even from, from families of like conservative families here in Santa Cruz. So I think there's this generational shift and I think that's reflective and it's showing how the left is slowly winning, I think, because even in conservative areas, you know, the youth are becoming more left too. For sure. And yeah. today, how about you? Yeah. So I grew up with my grandfather was a labor organizer with United Farm Workers. And growing up, I would ask him, uh, I was really interested in political history. I like doing interviews with like um, older members of my family. And I interviewed him and I asked him, why he got involved because I remember him hearing that like he did work with no pay and this was something that he was doing for committing his life to. And for me, like as a child, I couldn't think like, you know, that's like capitalism is showing right there, right? Where I think like, well, like anything that you have has to do has to have some kind of like net, uh, like you has to have a monetary gain. And that was me as a child asking him like why he would dedicate so much of his time. And what he told me is that he, he did the work because it was right. And that always stuck with me. And it's something that I always think about. And going with my father, he was, or he's also a DSA LA member who's watching this, but he's, uh, he, we're both Bernie Sanders delegates together. And he, he would take, uh, I would go with him to May Day rallies as a child and just be like literally three years old there. And I didn't understand what 
like collective bargaining or really what anybody was chanting, obviously, at these May Day rallies. But I, under, I saw people organizing together for what they believed was right and collective action. And I believe from that moment that collective, collective action brings change. And then when I was around 17 years old, I didn't quite know what my political compass was at that time. But I went after school to a rally with my friends from my mock trial team in high school to the Bernie Sanders rally. And after going to see Bernie Sanders speak, it was like everything came full circle and I knew exactly what my political compass was. I knew that everything, what he, what he said about giving universal health care and economic justice, that was, my, that was exactly what I believed in and I've been here since. Love it. See, I feel very much uh, that my story is in common with that in that Bernie 2016 felt like it gave me the vocabulary to know what my beliefs were. Um, and we all mentioned Bernie 2016. I'm curious what you think happened in the intervening four years. Maybe how you thought the campaign or Bernie's ideas developed from 2016 to 2020. I mean, we're all, you're, you're all delegates to the convention. So what do you think about Bernie 2020? What changed from that initial spark that got us all interested in it? Where is that spark led to? Let's switch up the orders. Zenaida, how about, how about you? I mean, from Bernie 2016, I mean, like my positions have remained generally the same, but at the same time, like from Bernie 2016 to 2020, I've been, I went to college, right? Like I, I coming out of the 2016 convention, I w was a recent high school graduate. And then in 2020, I'm a recent college graduate. So, so much has changed within that time. Obviously we've seen the rise of fascism within the United States with, and a mixture of Trumpism and being coming from a Latino community, seeing even the rise of Trumpism within my own community. And that has been like, we've seen the rise of these authoritarian policies and how, and the, the plight of the working class even more in the last four years. And that has all realized the reasons why Bernie's policies in 2016 were needed then. And they're even needed more than ever now. So that, I guess what, that would be my, I guess, comparison between 2016 and 2020. I don't know if I answered your question quite directly, but that's, that was at least the first thing that came to mind on that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that makes a lot of sense to me. Sebastian, you, you're, you're sort of in the middle of high school, right? When Trump gets elected, what do you think about that? What do you think about the change between, um, between the 16 to the 2020? Yeah. Then, and, I think what's in neither to build off of that, I think it's really interesting to see like the change, not only in the world, but kind of like in our generation and, you know, myself, like I felt like, um, like I wasn't involved in any politics or anything like that or any activism. I was just like a kid watching the TV, but like Bernie like awoke me. So like you go from 2015 and just me watching the TV to 2020, like I'm an organizer, I'm an activist, like I'm a political candidate, like I'm a, uh, you know, then I get involved in the Democratic Party. So like it, it completely like reshifted and re kind of awoke me. So it's interesting to see the contrast between that and how um, I think the Trump kind of presidency kind of pushed me to to be even more passionate and about my issues. But I think at the same time, I felt like um, maybe Bernie 2016 kind of prepared me for the now, you know, and it's like, even if we didn't win, I think that there is still like a reawakening with that race. Like we won the biggest state in the country. Um, you know, we, we, we have, and I think in a way it kind of shows how it's like, yeah, not there. We didn't take the presidency, but there's already been like this reawakening and this, this putting us young people into the fray and like training us to be that. Like I wouldn't be where I am today and like doing all the work I do and now being a delegate to the DNC and the other stuff I do if it wasn't for Bernie um, 2016. So it's kind of shows like, I feel like it's kind of made us, um, I don't know, just like it had a personal impact on us. And 2020 was a little different, of course, where I felt like some of the energy was kind of different. And like, I felt like something about 2016 was just so like, or 2015 was just so like, I don't know, like different. And it had this like different energy to it, but it could have been cause I was younger. So my perspective might've been different. And so it definitely did feel more organized this time around but I think there was this little like 
underdog thing that that made 2015 2016 more special to me in a way that i can't describe um and so that's just kind of like what i have to say on that yeah yeah no that's a, that's a really good point uh nita what, what about you what do you think so i think for 2016 what made that kind of so special i think a little bit what we're talking about is it kind of focused all this energy that existed like throughout the country and we at least for i think a lot of us on this call that we didn't even know that we were all out there especially because i wasn't a conservative we, most of us are from conservative areas and so i didn't know most of us were out there and then bernie showed up had our values and we were like, hey, and then there's a bunch of other people that all they have these values too. And so that's what made DSA so big because now we all focused our energy. And so I think it was really raw when it happened in 2016 and it was like the underdog thing, but then between 2016 and up to 2020, 2020 and on, it got really organized and focused. I mean, that's when we got the justice Democrats and got AOC and all that happening. And so we are so much more organized since then and so I think between then and also that's what got us so close to getting Bernie in office. And I can't believe we got so close but didn't make it, but it was so exciting. So that's what I think happened. For sure. Yeah, the focus of the, the squad and totally. I, I I hadn't thought of it that way, but that's that's very true. Ilo, how about you? What do you what do you think really changed between that twenty sixteen to twenty twenty campaign? Yeah, definitely. So I, I definitely, I think I wasn't the perfect time to be able to really experience the entire change because I'm, so I'm a millennial. I'm a, a, a one of the younger millennials. I'm a 94 baby. So I'm kind of like a cusp between the millennial generation and Gen Z. So I was right out of college. Like literally I, I graduated in 2015 from college. So I saw the start of the Bernie Sanders movement right as I was leaving uh, my college years. And I just moved to like a new city and everything. So I definitely uh, hear what Sebastian's saying about this underdog feeling that, that came out in 2015 because he, I mean, he just came out of nowhere. And I mean, people did not see him coming. And that was the beauty of it, that you joined this movement trying to take out the establishment from out of nowhere, like literally out of nowhere. In 2020, it was a little bit different that, you know, people already kind of knew that Bernie was gonna run and he was like already this kind of like, in a way, old news. Um, I will confess, I started off as a Warren supporter, sorry. Um, but then when she backtracked on Medicare for All, of course, I went back home. But I mean, uh, I, I definitely saw a change, not so much in the Bernie campaign, but in the movement. I thought the movement in 2020 was just so much stronger. Um, and I just felt a lot more camaraderie and solidarity. And in 2020, I actually was back home. So I, I moved back from New York and I was already kind of embedded into progressive socialist spaces. Um, so instead of, um, you know, kind of doing, you know, doing a few volunteerships here and there, not really doing, knowing, knowing what I needed to do, um, I, I'm a law student right now at an HBCU. So then I came on to the 2020 campaign as a North Carolina uh, HBCU organizer. So that was an amazing thing. I was working with students with, for Bernie, I was a victory captain, like literally leading up to Super Tuesday, deploying people to door knock from my house, door knocking. I mean, every single person that I knocked doors on said they were voting for Bernie, um, going into Hispanic, working class, Latino neighborhoods. It was just a beautiful thing, a beautiful show of solidarity. It felt like we were literally going into, uh, you know, to take back our country, um, like as an army. Um, and that really, I think, made me kind of a soldier of the struggle where like, I'm now uh, in positions of government. I'm, I'm uh, the vice chair of my Durham, the Durham Mayor's Hispanic Latino Committee. So I advise the mayor on Latino issues, one of the only DSA people that's part of the government. So, you know, I think he really created a different generation of leaders that are now really coming up. So I'm really excited to see what all of us, uh, even the people that are not here on this call, there's so many of us spread across the nation. I'm very excited to see how we change the country. You're on mute, Nikki. Again with that. Sorry about that. Uh, but I think that's so true to load that it really, Bernie really inspired people and that that inspiration happened in 2016. So when 2020 hit, we were all ready for it. Um, 
we're having such a great conversation. I don't want to cut it short. I want to ask one more question because there's been something that everyone has sort of mentioned, and I'm curious to hear more. So how is it organizing as a young person in either conservative spaces or party spaces, which let's be real, those are conservative spaces too. See, all my organizing experiences with DSA, so it's with folks who I pretty much agree with. Um, I'm curious, what's it like to talk to people in a party who you might not agree with or talk to people in your community who might be hostile to socialism? And you know what, Ilo, you were just in it. Let's start with you. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So, um, I, yeah, I know a lot about organizing in conservative spaces. So I grew up in rural North Carolina, not where I'm at right now. Durham is very, very progressive. Um, but I know, you know, I grew up around Trump people when, so my dad was deported when I was like 13 or 14. And I do remember, I mean, people that I know voted for Trump, like took me in and were very, very good. And like, you know, I was having dinner at their house and it was just a different time. It was a different feeling. And that always kind of stuck with me. Like these people aren't gone. Uh, that's, it, it always kind of stuck with me. And, and, and I think that's the hardest part, being somebody who is Latino and Hispanic and hearing the vitriol that comes out of the Trump campaign uh, about immigrants and, you know, hating brown people and black people. It's very disgusting. But then when you're down in the ground and you're talking to another human being, um, having those experiences really helped me to see, okay, like you're going to tell me that I'm not welcome here, but how am I going to respond to you with love? And I think that really was an eye-opening experience because I was able to have conversations with Trump supporters during the Bernie Sanders campaign um, around things that we all agree on, like big business is screwing us over. We need a $15 minimum wage. We are seeing, I mean, these huge corporate interests come into the South specifically and, you know, take away our wealth and take them into, you know, CEOs pockets. Like we should not be uh, allowing ourselves to be subjected to that. And a lot of times that led into a conversation like, hey, like maybe immigrants aren't the problem. Maybe we need to put some more regulation on these people. And that's when the conversations really started. And I was able to flip some Trump supporters. My stepdad is a hardcore Republican. He voted for Bernie. He's a Medicare for all guy. He's a finance guy. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm definitely a little bit more optimistic than I think um, a lot of people, um, simply because I have lived with these, with, with these hardcore conservatives. And I do think that I, I really enjoy uh, organizing in these spaces. And organizing within the party structure, that's a whole other thing that is, I mean, you know, they're conservatives in another way. Like they, they don't want anything to do with progressives. They think we're taking over their party. They think we're going to destroy their way of life. That's just another way of organizing. And I, I actually feel a lot more comfortable organizing with Trump supporters than, than the party people, to be, to be honest. I, I see what you mean. Um, Nina, Orange County is also a more conservative part of California. Curious about your experience with this. Yeah, so I mean, for me, yeah, I grew up here and I didn't know that there were people like us at all in this world <laughs> when I grew up here. But when Bernie showed up on the scene and, and I decided I wanted to organize for him, I was knocking on doors in Orange County and I found out that there were actually tons of people that, you know, maybe they wouldn't call themselves socialists or progressives, but they believe in the same values that we believe in. And I think when you're on the ground, you realize those people, there's so many more of them than you would like that I than I than did I know before. And so I guess I was kind of surprised by that. And then I found it also interesting though that I would go to like party clubs, so like democratic party clubs to kind of you know speak Bernie's message. And I found such a different feeling there where it was just like very unaccepted this idea. They felt like it was too you know too much about revolution and and they just felt like it was just too much. And but, on, you know, when I was talking to people on the streets, like knocking on doors, everyone was like, nothing's happening, you know, nothing is being done. And so I just felt that, you know, I only got into this be really, you know, the political organizing because of Bernie. And so coming into it from that perspective, it was a very positive experience because people I talked to, we had the same values and ideals, unless I went to like a Democratic Party, like a very established one, and then it was a little bit different. <laughs> so, yeah. For sure. You know, Sebastian, you were talking about this a little bit earlier. I'm also wondering 
what it's been like because you're running a race right now. You're running an elected race. So tell us about that, too, because that's got to add in a whole nother layer. What's it like organizing out in Santa Clarita? Yeah, it's totally interesting because I think and I think it's very reflective of just like the total shift and like reawakening that's happened in this country. Um, because I used to be like, you know, I would do, give speeches and like I remember one time I gave this speech in high school and as to this crowd of people during this like festival and it was about like how immigrants are better Americans than, than like US citizens. And <laughs> it was like super controversial. And I had people like walking out, like they were so mad at me. Like I would anger people in Santa Clarita. Like I, I created enemies for standing up. Like there were a point in high school where like people like stopped talking to me. They did not like me. And then I, but I stayed at it and I stayed consistent. And I think that's one thing that where people like Doug Bernie and why people I think still dig progressives and people in the DSA because like I think we're often like we often but like really believe what we're talking about and we're like genuine and so I just kept at it and I, I kept at it even when I didn't have support and then I, I rose up to then like become student body president of the, my local college and then I, I ended up launching um, a campaign to flip the school board for that college as well as um, just also organizing in the movement that was happening. And Santa Creta was like this historically kind of like white conservative place, but it started diversifying. And then like the, the protests during George Floyd were like massive. And so I kind of rose with that and I kind of became a leader through it all. And I thought it was kind of interesting because it's like, in a way I was able to amass a lot of coalitions and a lot of support and like even more than some people who are conservative or who are like establishment more type Democrats even though I'm DSA, even though I'm a Sanders guy. And I think it's just like, it, even though there's, there's been problems and like hard times organizing like in this community, in a way it's like, I've literally seen it transform. And I think it's kind of like inspiring to, sh to see like, I I have a serious chance at winning the race too. And, and, and um, just, you know, the work I've been doing has been supported way more than it used to. And I think it's reflective of, this movement and also like it's more than just like all right socialism or just bernie you know and i think there's something to be said that like you can build coalitions and you can create a movement and like not everybody has to be like a card carrying member of the dsa right but like you can still be true to your values and still build those coalitions and people will still like respect you and in a way like even if they don't fully identify with that it's like the conversation still shifts because they're like man like i still view this person as a leader even though i disagree with them and it's like i think it's just it gives me optimism that, you know, the city I'm in used to be like the MAGA Republican, you know, conservative capital, of like SoCal, LA County. And now it's like, you know, uh, a young DSA member might be elected to office at 20 years old, which has never been seen in the city. And I, I didn't give up one of my values. So it's like, you know, America's changing. So cool stuff. It, it makes me hopeful, but we'll see what happens. Maybe they'll like lock me up in two years. I don't know. Maybe I'll become like, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> well, hopefully not. And and I think you're right though, that, the, that the country is changing the the attitudes of, of folks uh, young and old. And Zenaida, bring us home on this. I, I think the um, I, I think that the w the party aspect, because where you're from in Los Angeles is not necessarily the most conservative part of the city, but. What is it like organizing as a young person in the party spaces? Yeah, so in March, I was recently elected along some other DSA members to be part of the Los Angeles County Democratic Party State Central Committee. And that's already been a really interesting experience, especially as like part participating in these events online. Like anytime someone brings up a concern, it's like immediately in the comments you have the person who's been it at the LACDP for like 30 years saying, oh, it's just you Bernie people. And it's like that the comment that the person brought up at the LACDP meeting had nothing to do with Bernie at all. It could just be like a procedural question. And it's like, for some reason within at least like the LA County Democratic Party, it's like dissent became synonymous with being a Bernie person. And I think that's also obviously more has a positive connotation, but I think the LACDP or establishment people like weaponize that often as saying like, it's just, you're just a troublemaker. You're just uh, trying to uh, stir things up. And that's been 
difficult to push it against that, especially given like, you know, being a young person and being a young Latina and having a lot of that, like immediately where anytime I brought up anything with like a strong sense of passion, it's like, oh, you're just being like really ag aggressive or maybe you like, you're being like a toxic Bernie person every time I say like, oh, people need health healthcare. But to that point, since this is like the concluding comment, I just would like to really convince, try to convince people to be like Sebastian and run for local office and run for these small uh, Democratic Party positions because the more you take up space in there, the more you you are able to push a DSA agenda. And that I just would that would just be my ending note because we have so California is quite often referred to as a state of progressivism. And yet we have a super majority in the state and we're not able to get universal health care. We're not able to get uh, to pass all the progressive policies we want. So being a Democrat isn't necessarily uh, synonymous with being progressive, but as de democratic socialists, it's on us to try to push that. Yeah, I think that's an awesome note to end on. This was a super inspiring conversation. It's so cool to hear. I mean, like you said, the country's changing for the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ilo. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Zanaida. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. And um, yeah, we will we will see you soon. In often. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Y'all are awesome. So amazing. I was like riveted. The whole, I was like this. <laughs> <laughs> watching the screen anyways awesome job everyone thank you so much our young delegates so cute so wise i am so excited to see what the future holds for us the future really feels like it will be socialist when it's in the hands of these capable people our capable comrades nikki thanks so much for moderating with me it was so awesome you're amazing at all that you're doing for us this evening and all the work you do with dsa um if you want to learn how to become an organizer like nikki <laughs> Join DSA. We want to develop our leaders because we really need your help. It's a collective effort. We can't do it alone. We say solidarity forever for a reason because it's absolutely necessary. I just uh, want to say one thing about DSA. DSA is a dues funded organization. So when you sign up and you pay dues, that money is collectively used to build the projects. We don't take money from big donors. You know, we're not an NGO. We're a dues funded organization. It's a people's union. So if you join and you pay dues, it's a democratic and participatory organization. So your dues and what you say and what you want shape the organization. I think joining DSA is the best decision I've ever made. And if there's anybody watching, please join. Uh, we do not turn folks away for lack of funds. Dues could be a dollar a month. So please, please join because DSA, like we heard tonight, is the future. And we want you to be a part of it. Absolutely. All right. What are we going out on? Hey, we got to give a shout out, right? To all yeah. our comrades. So we showed a video in the beginning. A lot of you, everyone's coming in from work, coming in a little late maybe, so you didn't get to see it. We're gonna replay that DSA delegates video that was also a collective effort. Nikki drafted it, we went over the script. Um, Zenaida came up with the idea and then Michelle Boley, one of our um, very talented comrades too, she directed and put together this video that featured 24 delegates from across 11 states. Are we gonna do the shout out, Nikki? Sure, yes, those states, Arizona, California, Idaho, Illinois, Massachusetts, Michigan, North Carolina, Washington, Wisconsin, Tennessee, and Texas. Now, let me shout out all the comrades in the video. <laughs> Thank you so much to Michelle, Idolo, Nina, Miller, Justice, Melissa, Jeanette, Alfred, LaDawn, Alan, Corey, William, Gina, Shirley, Reggie, Beth, Dennis, Margaret, Rand, Danielle, Jared, CJ, Gina, and Summer. Thank you so much for making this video. The reason it's good is because all of you all helped make it. Love to see it. Cool, okay, well, we're just gonna play the video and then uh, we're gonna go home. Oh wait, we are home. But uh, <laughs> after that, uh, thank you so much for watching. Oh, what were you gonna say? Share, share the link, bit.ly, the link that you used to get in here, bit.ly slash DSA delegates. It's gonna be recorded and you can replay it, play yourself to sleep. Nice bedtime story. Yeah, and of course, donate to and help campaign for Marquita, please. We really need her to win. We need Bernie to have a colleague in Senate. So, uh, <laughs> heck yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for watching. Solidarity forever, and we're gonna let the video play us out. Thanks again, folks.
We are Bernie Sanders delegates to the Democratic National Convention and proud members of the Democratic Socialists of America, representing the millions of people who voted for Bernie Sanders in the 2020 primary. That's millions of people who want a Green New Deal, Medicare for all, housing as a human right, free college for all, ending private prisons, a federal jobs guarantee, guarantee. and getting big money out of politics. politics. We've been told by the party that democratic unity is the way to make progress in 2020. So why weren't these demands included in the Democratic Party platform? As DSA members, we demand more. We stand in solidarity with those fighting for democratic socialism. And taxing the rich for a better world. Trump, Trump is, is a symptom. symptom. Capitalism is the disease. Removing one person from office will not be enough to address the serious problems facing us. COVID-19 has already killed hundreds of thousands of people here in the United States, and the numbers keep going higher. Over 40 million jobs have been lost. And countless people are on the verge of eviction. But the government has given everyday people crumbs. While overseeing a historic transfer of wealth to the ultra-rich. Workers' rights are being decimated, and union membership is at a record low. Millions have lost their health care and are paying skyrocketing premiums. Police continue their assault on Black lives and our civil rights. On top of all this, 2020 was the hottest year in recorded history. And scientists say we have 10 years to take action on the climate crisis or risk the end of human civilization. This violence and deprivation is a wake up call. We can no longer deny that our system is broken. I joined DSA because systemic change happens when people rise up together in solidarity. Democratic socialists are organizing the progressive left. DSA members are supporting progressive candidates winning electoral races in our communities and across the country. Passing legislation. Supporting, supporting labor, labor strikes. strikes. Protesting and taking direct action. And, and building, building a mass, mass movement, movement of the working, working class. class. DSA's work inside and outside the electoral system is its strength. We are organizing the working class. To join together to fight against billionaires and corporations. They've got money, but we've got the people. And we demand an end to the cruel, inefficient, and life-threatening system we call capitalism. We need socialism in our lifetime. And, and we, we need, need your help. help. Not me. Us. Not me. Us. Not me, us, was a call for solidarity. And continued struggle for a better world. Answer the call. And join, join DSA. DSA.